All right, well, welcome to the February 8th, 2021 meeting of the Falls Church City Council. Our apologies for the delay in getting started. We had some technical, di technical difficulties, which we hope are now resolved. Um, but welcome to you all. Thank you for joining us this evening. I'd like to call this meeting to order and uh, ask the clerk to read the virtual meeting notice. Yes, thank you. Um, this meeting is being held pursuant to and in compliance with the Virginia Freedom of Information Act, section 2.2-3708.2 and state and local legislation adopted to allow for continued government <clears throat> operation during the COVID-19 declared emergency. All participating members of city council are present at this meeting through electronic means and members of the public may view it at www.fallschurchva.gov backslash council meetings. Uh, public comments are accepted virtually um, from those who have signed up to speak via the meeting platform by noon on the day of the meeting. Uh, speaker forms are located at www.fallschurchva.gov backslash public comment until noon on the day of the meeting. Um, following submission of, of any speaker form, uh, speakers will receive email instructions to join the meeting. Um, written public comments, including those for public hearings sent in advance of the meeting will be accepted at city clerk at fallschurchva.gov. And we always accept comments at that ad address, city clerk at fallschurchva.gov. And we, I send them to city council as soon as po possible. And then they are summarized at the next regular meeting. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Will you call roll please? I will. Vice Mayor Conley. Here. Mr. Duncan. Yes, here. Ms. Hardy. Here. Mr. Lickenhouse. Here. Ms. Shantz Hiscott. Here. Mr. Snyder. Here. And Mayor Tarter. Here. Thank you, Council. Thank you. And let's move on now to the Pledge of Allegiance. I don't know if we have our screen that shows the U.S. flag on it or maybe we can pull that up, but I would ask that you all um, please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance, wherever you might be, please rise and hopefully have a flag that you can uh, uh, look to, but if not, please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. All right. Uh, again, welcome to you all. Before we get started, I have some important news, some breaking news. Uh, it is our city attorney's birthday on Saturday. And so we want to wish her all a uh, happy birthday. And as, our, as is our custom, the newest city council person will now sing happy birthday in solo to her. And I believe that's Miss Hiscott now. So uh, I don't know if that was mentioned to you, uh, Debbie, before, when you got started, but that is our custom and our, actually, I think it's in our rules. Um, so I'm going to, I'm kidding. Uh, but anyway, happy birthday to our, uh, our city attorney. Hopefully she's on the line and joining us, but we, we wish her the best, um, best and thank her for all the great work she's done for us. But thank let's move you. on now to the receipt of public comments. Um, Madam Clerk, will you, uh, read the summary of written comments? I will. Let's, um, I think we received this at the last meeting. Um, the Social Justice Committee of Falls Church wrote to support the use of voluntary concessions to provide more affordable housing at the Broad and Washington Project. Uh, John Wilson of 301 Buxton Road uh, wrote in support of the concept of using voluntary concessions to provide for more affordable housing. We got a number of comments on the noise ordinance. Um, the following wrote to ask, that daytime noise hours not be extended and shared their problems with noise from outdoor entertainment at the Falls Church Distillers. Um, these folks are from 455 South Maple Street. Uh, that's the 455 at Tinner Hill building. Uh, Scott Adams, Joshua Kamenetz, E. Del Rosario, Natalie Duffy, Daryl Green, Mike Hernandez, Rob Kelly, Lindsay Kawaki, Sherry Maples, Mark Plattenberg, Laura Rosenblatt, Greg Wicks, and another resident who asked to remain anonymous. And I did receive a few other comments after I put this together. So let me look at those. Um, let's see. 
we have uh, Melissa Ragu from 455 uh, also uh, shared problems with the noise and asked that the hours not be extended. Um, Deanne Bolden was also is also a resident of 455 South Maple uh, facing the Falls Church Distillers and would um, not like to see the time extended uh, later than it already is. Um, and then we received an email from David Tax from um, Clarendon's Beach Shack. And he, um, let's see, what did he say? <laughs> he says that um, he has tried, you know, to maintain, be a good neighbor while maintaining his business and providing entertainment. And hopefully that's been a good balance. Um, and he asks, um, you know, that you continue to support uh, businesses that are trying to stay in business. But he also um, recommends some kind of field trips to um, different locations to see what the decibel levels are, are and how they sound at different um, locations. So those are our noise ordinance comments. Um, we also did receive um, one resident from Merrill House wrote uh, with the same request that the hours not be extended and stated they were also disturbed by the noise at Falls Church Distillers. Deborah Z. Roth wrote in support of extending daytime noise hours, hours to at least 11 p.m. to support businesses. Claudia and Eric Schultz of 107 Lawton Street asked that the noise code mirror Arlington County's code to define daytime hours as between 7 a.m. and 9 p.m. on weekdays and 10 a.m. and 9 p.m. on Saturday, Sunday, and legal holidays. John Wilson of 301 Buxton Road also provided some comments on general administration of a noise ordinance. The following asked for the council's assistance in reopening schools for in-person learning. Julie Felgar, James Fitzgerald of 316 North Underwood Street, Kendra Lee, Evans and Elizabeth Rice of 220 Midvale Street, Sarah and Jeff Shows, 303 North Virginia Avenue, Renee Sturgill, Rob Sucher, and Drew Walter. Um, in other comments, Wendy Cherry of 3713 Je George Mason Drive asked that COVID vaccinations not be made mandatory. Uh, Sean Daskin asked that parking enforcement for state inspection sticker violations cease on city streets. Sally Phillips of 200 North Maple Avenue asked that the city provide waste pickup at the Park Towers condominium. And the Village Preservation and Improvement Society provided comments on the proposed public art chapter of the comprehensive plan. And that was it. All right. Well, thank you very much. Are there any uh, comments from folks uh, who are on the line right now? Any? Uh, no, I, no, I actually we didn't have anybody sign up to speak live this evening. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Let's move on now to the report, uh, the annual report of the EDA. Is Mr. Young with us uh, now, Bob? I am here. All right. Well, listen, Bob, you guys have done a lot of great work over these past years, and particularly this last one. So we look forward to hearing more uh, formally what you have to say, but want to, before you even begin, congratulate you on the, your fine efforts. Well, thank you. Um, I'll direct those comments to staff, first of all. They've just worked their heads off. I'll come to that during the briefing. Uh, and our EDA members have put in extraordinary amounts of time to accomplish the goals that we have. Next slide. <clears throat> um, we all know about the COVID response. Um, I'll go into the programs that we undertook, but let me just note that we've had very positive feedback from the business community. Um, this is one of the few programs aimed directly at them, uh, you know, for some time. Um, many of them let staff know that um, if it didn't save their business, it certainly helped a great deal. Next slide. Um, as you know, we did grab and go banners. Uh, you can see them all over the city. Next slide. Let me just, let me. Let me just say that um, I'm going to go through these pretty quickly. Council members should feel free to interrupt if you have questions, but 
we've got quite a deck here, and I don't want to take up too much time. Um, as you all know, with Council's great help, uh, we we're able to distribute $500,000 to the business community. Uh, people were grateful for it. Uh, that includes the $4,000 from the high school, 2020 high school seniors, uh, which I think was quite an effort on their part and should be applauded. Next slide. We modified the Little City logo to add safe. Next. Pole banners, you can see them out on the street. I'm sure everyone has. Next slide. <clears throat> Posters are all over the city. I thought this was a particularly helpful one. Um, you know, just sort of getting the word out to the to the public. Next slide. All right, looks like looks like I'm having a little trouble with the PDF. I'm going to go to slide nine and see if that works for you, Bob. Yeah, that's fine. Perfect. Um, you'll see some of these signs around the city, not a lot of them, but uh, I know, uh, for example, over by Panera Bread, where they do quite a bit of business with people picking up curbside. It's been very, very helpful. The city moved very, very quickly to help us with these, and it's greatly appreciated that staff was able to do that. Next slide. Um, basically, all, all this is saying is, is we were able to get permission to continue our work, um, which you're seeing the results of. Next slide. Um, I think we ought to take a minute or two on the wayfinding study. Um, you all know that that's been going on now. We began our effort about a year and a half ago. Next slide. Uh, you'll see here a listing starting on September 10th of 19, um, where we began to meet about this particular project, engage folks who became our consultants. Um, we had uh, every one of these meetings listed here, um, around 12 or 15, were all public. Um, let me point out, hold on a second. Give me just a minute here and I'll get to it. Um, on September 11th, third one down, uh, we that was an in-person meeting with a lot of folks, including Vipus. Uh, a lot of comments were received and many were incorporated into the plan. Um, so the main point here is this has been an extremely public process with many, many, many meetings, all of which were public. We, as you'll recall, we had two meetings with the council um, that were all broadcast virtually to go over the, the plan. Um, we were very fortunate the council was willing and able to reimburse our um, $500,000 grants and that gave us the funds to be able to fund this entire project. We're, we're pretty close to receiving bids. It's out for bid now. And then we'll see what the numbers look like and what the time frame is. But we're hoping that we can begin implementation in the spring. Any questions on this program before I move on? Hearing none, uh, we'll go to another I of have our... Mr. Mr. Young, I do have a question. Sure. Just regarding the the scope of what we're doing. Because as we've talked about at different times, we were going to do certain pieces and not do all of it at one time. And I wasn't aware of a decision. Did we make a decision or did the EDA make a decision about the whole package or pieces of it? Um, there was a lot of discussion, as you point out, uh, about doing a partial um, implementation program. The 
decision, as I understood it, at the last meeting we had with council was if council was able to reimburse the second $250,000, which in time council did that, then we would be able to implement the entire program all at one time and thereby we hope save around $100,000, not to mention the time involved um, in, you know, not stringing this out over years, but rather months. Can't hear you. Sorry, that was all part of that conversation. Correct. That we had. Correct. On your account. Okay. But we never made any, Mr. Shields, we never made any official announcement to the community that we were headed in that direction or that we were able to fund the whole thing. I asked because people have asked me, well, one person sent me a message asking was that when was the decision made to do the whole package? And I had remembered talking about it. I just didn't remember that we, that decision was made. It must've been at an EDA meeting or another place. For, for the wayfinding signage? Yes. Specifically? Well, that it is yes. EDA. It is EDA dollars that are being used for that. So that was not a council appropriation. That was an EDA appropriation. Um, the city council's action uh, in the last budget amendment was to fully fund the EDA's business assistance program using CARES money. That was a council okay. decision, and that was made with the last budget amendment. But the funding for the wayfinding sign signage has been strictly a, an EDA funding okay. uh, decision. So, so the signs, the existing signs that are there now, are going to come down. The Correct. old-fashioned, traditional, false church. They're only fifty signs. years old. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> but as part of this, those are going to come down. Correct. And the partnership that the city's had with Vipas all along will no longer be there correct well i don't you know i don't know about that aspect of it right right uh, i wasn't aware that there was a formal partnership uh certainly i've been aware and um there were discussions with Vipus representatives uh at more than one meeting uh obviously their concern is they put up these signs 50 or 60 years ago they liked them i get that um but a decision is made pretty much community wide and certainly in the EDA and with the council at, at the last council meeting, it was discussed in great detail if this, then that, and the EDA took that to mean that council was pretty much on board with the plan. Uh, and therefore we have moved ahead right. uh, and we're ready to implement. That all make, that all makes sense. And I, I like these new signs. I'm, I just want to make sure I get the, when I reply to the person who's asked me, I'm wondering, Mr. Shields, if there's a way for the city to notify VIPAS that this change is going to happen so that their partnership on the science is no longer needed. Um, yes, we can certainly do that. And the nature of the partnership really has been one where VIPAS designed the signs, ordered the signs, and then uh, they were delivered to the city's public works department who then installed the signs. And um, so that's the way that partnership has worked in the past. Right. And then whenever one gets damaged, run over, whatever, there's a new one that gets replaced. That's right. And, and right. Veep has uh, paid for the signs exactly. as well. Um, and exactly. so that um, uh, was very helpful. Right. I, just, I think it would be gracious to be able to send a note saying thank you for these many, many years of doing this and we're on to the next set of signs. Thanks, Mr. Young. I, I just wanted to clarify all that, and I appreciate all the work that went into this wayfinding. You're very welcome. Ms. Harding, uh, you, do you have a Go ahead. I was just going to add, because when Mary Beth raised the decluttering, so it's not just decluttering the old signs, but as we've talked about in the past, we just have a sign proliferation issue everywhere across the city. So I think part of the work that I'm excited about, besides obviously the new signage that'll be better, is that we actually get rid of all the old signs that might conflict. And so it really should help um, with the parking and all the other issues we've had. Um, the second thing while we're on wayfinding is, uh, Mr. Shields, is this going to come back to us when there's actually a construction contract? Is it going to be over kind of the purchasing threshold? And so council will have some sort of formal approving authority? So uh, because it is EDA funds, that was not the, in, the in plan. Um, 
We have put it out to bid, and as, as Mr. Young noted, that process is underway. We have a pre-bid conference this week. Um, and I'll, uh, I'll discuss it with Jim Wise, but because of the funding source, it was not intended that the contract come to city council for final approval. I don't need to hold it up. It's just more of a question about how it would work since it's a little different. Thank you. All right, Mr. Young. Okay, next next uh, slide. Um, as you all uh, know, we did an extensive parking study. Um, it's important to note that the study found across the city that there's more than adequate commercial parking, except in the two hotspot zones we're all well aware of, um, uh, behind Dogwood and in that area, and of course, over by Clarendon's. Um, we've, we have a list that I'll, I'll show in just a minute of things that were recommended. Uh, Kaiser's an important part of that but we've done what we can moving ahead. Next slide, please. These are the proposed solutions that the um, study folks <clears throat> proposed to us. We've attempted to move ahead and implement as many as possible, but it's been very, very difficult. Um, some of these are long-term, some of them are short-term. As you saw on the previous slide, we're able to clean up that area by the city's parking uh, over across um, on Maple there, uh, Maple and Park. Um, some of these things have been implemented already in specific projects. Uh, we believe that the wayfinding project will help with things like visibility of public parking. Um, there are other things that involve um, high-tech solutions that start to get into issues of uh, public policy with respect to um, personal privacy and things like that. But I can assure you that we continue, staff continues to spend time and effort as does the EDA trying to implement the results of the study. But let me again come back to the central conclusion that across the city, there's not a parking problem. Um, so let me leave it at that. Any questions on the parking? Hearing none, next slide. Um, we continue to work hard with Kaiser Permanente. Um, there's a lot of back and forth. This has gone on for years. We're a lot closer to a solution um, in terms of getting an electronic sign put up that will prominently notify the public that parking is available at the times in which it is available. Um, as you all know, there's also a proposal for the CIT, CIP um, to put the proposed elevator on the face of the building back into the CIP, and that will be a, an item of further discussion. I think it's something the EDA backs, uh, but there hasn't been any formal action on that. Uh, I see Ross has a, a question. Yeah, Bob, sorry, my uh, fingers weren't fast enough to get my hand up on the parking. Um, the uh, Where did you guys land on studying parking meters in the uh, the hotspot zones? Um, we've landed on, we, we think it's a good idea, but implementation is an issue. Frankly, Ross, with everything that we've been dealing with, and, and I really mean everything the staff is dealing with, we just uh. haven't been able to get to it. I personally think it's a good idea. It's on our list. Uh, we'll be having a uh, an EDA retreat sometime in the next several weeks, and that will certainly be one of the items on the agenda. Okay, great. 
Thanks, Bob. I know you guys got a full plate, but yeah, I appreciate you continue to look into that. I think it'll help too. All right, go ahead. Thanks. Next line. <laughs> Looks like I'm having another PDF problem. Well, the next. So I seem to be missing 16 and 17. Yeah, those two relate to downtown beautification. And let me just say briefly that, um, you know, we have put out a lot of um, new benches and trash cans. They may not be beautiful, but they're very functional. Um, as you all know, we had the mural installed, some uh, electrical boxes wrapped. Um, we continue to spend small amounts of money making sure that Mr. Brown's Park um, has seasonal plantings. I think it looks great all the time, uh, and that's thanks to staff, uh, mainly Naomi, which we'll get to in a minute. So we're on honoring essential workers. And Bob, I'm going to try to reopen the slides so they show why you're speaking. I will let the public know they were posted to the website along with the agenda packet while I'm trying to reopen it. Okay. Well, we attempt to honor essential workers by having the lights on the trees all the time. Um, our next slide has to do with EDO staffing. We thought it appropriate to include that in this report. We've asked, as you all know, we have been funding um, a, a now full-time position the last year and a half, I believe. And we're hoping that council will include that position as a full-time city funded uh, position for the upcoming fiscal year. Um, we think it's critically important. Uh, I would point out in this context that if one looks at the programs the city has to help the business community, and I'll come to the other side of that in a minute, there aren't a lot of them. And having this staff position uh, has been really important in outreach, in trying to, you know, everything from the, the grants to Mr. Brown's Park and so on. So I'm urging council to fund that position. <clears throat> While I'm on positions, um, before I get to our <clears throat> proposed 2021 program, um, at the most general level, the EDA feels pretty strongly that in those places where the business community is most touched, if I can put it that way, where there's the most interaction are those areas that from our perspective are ones that are least funded, that is positions. Obviously, I'm going to um, the area of inspectors and plan reviewers. If one takes a step back for a minute and thinks about, you know, what is the most interaction that businesses have with the city? It's very often when they move in, they have to do work on their space, retail or office, and therefore they submit plans to the city government. To say that, in my opinion, and the count in the EDA's opinion, that group is underfunded is putting it really, really, really mildly. Um, what they're being asked to do is simply not possible. And I hope that the city council will take a hard look, um, trying to have these guys um, do all the inspections for a huge high school for Founders Row. Guess what happens? All the little guys get lost. They can't possibly, they just physically and mentally can't respond the way we would hope they would. It's my understanding that the city has an ongoing 
review, and I'm sure we'll, we'll be chiming in on that as that comes to the fore, hopefully in the next several weeks. Moving on to 2021, I won't try to go through this whole list, but as you can see, it's ambitious. <clears throat> One area that I would try to point out in a very strong manner is our social media presence, the city generally and the EDA in particular is really just awful. Um, these things aren't kept up. Um, that should be the most important thing that the city's doing with respect to things like tourism. Um, what's going on in the city? Staying in touch with our citizens. Um, I think that's an important one and we will be working hard on that and coming to you with proposals later in the year. We'll have a retreat in the next few weeks uh, and we'll develop a, a very specific list of projects going forward. Um, let me just end with the EDA members have put in hundreds and hundreds of hours in this past year, but staff has put in thousands. And I can't say enough good things about our very, very small staff that have done yeoman's work nights, weekends. Believe me, I get the emails 24 seven. So I want to publicly thank them and thank council for its support. Happy to answer any questions. All right, well, thank you, Bob. And thank, thank you to the rest of the EDA. I know that's not with you tonight and EDA staff, EDA staff. You guys have been busy and done a lot of great work um, during these difficult times. And uh, it's evident through this report, um, all the great work you've done. So uh, our hats off to you and to the, to the uh, staff and your board members. Uh, let's open it up to questions then. Uh, questions from uh, city council for Mr. Young. Anybody have any questions? So let's start with Mr. Snyder and then we'll go to Mr. Lichtenhaus. Dave. Thank you and uh, Bob, thank you for a um, very comprehensive presentation. Um, my question is, uh, since uh, budgetary actions have been requested, um, I'm very interested in a calculation uh, of the value of the EDA's work and what we can expect in terms of new businesses or other business support if we respond affirmatively to the budgetary request. Businesses function on dollars and cents. And so um, I appreciate the work, but what I would like is more of a quantification. How many new businesses have been brought in as a result of the EDA? How many would we expect? How many businesses have been preserved, et cetera, so that we can make a, a budgetary decision based upon full information? Thank you. Bob, you're on mute. You're still on mute. Got it. Let me respond if I may. Um, actually, we have that work, uh, what we call return on investment, Councilman Snyder, uh, that we, we're trying to develop those numbers. That's difficult. It's hard to know. You know, we can count businesses that go out of business in most cases. Um, we can, for the most part, account for businesses that um, come into the city, uh, how one goes about calculating um, what dollars they generate other than taxes um, is, and, and what sort of non-tax impacts they have on the city uh, is difficult, but we intend to undertake that to the best of our ability. I know staff is working on that as we speak. Thank you very much. Very helpful. Yep. Mr. Lichtenhaus, follow up, <clears throat> Mr. Scott. Yeah, thanks. So, Bob, the um, your comment about communication, social media in particular, um, you know, I, I've, I've talked with folks in, in development planning about that. I know it's been an ongoing conversation uh, in the city. I, I, for one, couldn't agree more 
uh, that we've got to do more with social media and communications. And especially, and you probably attended some of the same conferences I have. I mean, you, you typically have a, a fairly large showing from economic development groups, you know, at things like ICSC and NAOP and ULI, because, you know, regardless of how um, great your jurisdiction is, regardless of how great your town or city is, uh, how wonderful it is and how much we love it, if people don't know about it uh, and we're not out there selling it, uh, people aren't going to buy it. And there, there's a direct correlation to that with businesses. And I think that especially with the, um, you know, the number of, of possible interactions with folks in the business community, uh, folks in the real estate community, uh, they're going to be limited because of COVID going forward. That social media presence and the consistent, I'll say, unified communication and message about Falls Church that gets people interested in opening up a business here, gets people interested in coming shopping at businesses here. Um, without that, we're going to be missing out. And it, it, we've kind of, we've, we've, I would say we're at a crossroads, but we've really kind of crossed through that crossroads on the other side. And with all of the development that's taking place and the fact that we are on the region's radar, it's going to be more important forever, or I'm sorry, more important than ever uh, for us to put together that consistent, polished messaging about the city because we are now attracting the attention or, or looking to attract the attention uh, of, of, of businesses and foot traffic and dollars to be spent here. So I couldn't agree with that more. And I would certainly urge um, the city, uh, and if it's a staffing issue, we need to address that, um, that that's something that, that we look to solve for uh, here in the very near future, because we don't want to put all this hard work uh, and money to work here in the city, you know, building infrastructure, schools, approving development, uh, and not following that with uh, with the message and communication and social media that is consistent with, you know, the type of brand uh, that we're pursuing here in the city as a whole. So uh, I just want to put an exclamation point on that. Um, everything else that you've said, uh, Bob, I, I agree with it, and I appreciate the work that the EDA has done. I think it's incredibly important, especially now that we're all locked down. Um, we don't have the same opportunities to get out there and sell our city and businesses the way that we would like. So thank you for doing that. But that communications piece uh, and having that consistent branded polished message, uh, I think is is incredibly important. So thank you. All right, Ms. Hiscott, followed by Ms. Hardy. Just like to add another exclamation point to what Ross was just was just stating about our social media and like and you and the EDA have identified. Uh, not only having some place that people could search out on a website, but pushing out the information so that if someone's not necessarily looking for us, we still are getting out message out to them, meaning um, proactively building content, building out the network of social media um, through those organizations that, and conferences that Ross was listing. That really pushes the Falls Church brand out to people rather than anticipating or waiting for people to come search uh, out, search us. Uh, for a place to live, a place to have their business, et cetera, a place to shop or eat. Um, so I'm all in support of that. And again, to reiterate what you're talking about in terms of if it uh, is additional staffing that we need to increase upon that communications plan, I think that also can tie into the return on investment that we can demonstrate um, by improving that social media presence. Uh, and on the uh, staffing and Mr. Schneider's comments about uh, the return on, on investment. I think part of that demonstration is not only on what we bring in or what we keep, but how quickly we can do so. So with regard to inspectors and permit uh, staff, that if you can bring somebody online three, four, five, six months earlier, what does that do to increase your city revenues and the taxes you can collect and the revenue you're going to collect on that? So just including that as part of the return on investment estimations uh, as well. So I think that's really important. Thank you. All right, Ms. Hardy, followed by Mr. Duncan. Great. Thank you. Um, thank you, Bob. I've had the privilege of being your liaison for five years now, so I certainly appreciate how active you all have been traditionally, but especially this year, kind of post-COVID, responding to the crisis. Um, as we hopefully move into recovery, um, I would love the EDA's recommendations on those temporary measures that we took in the spring and whether some of those should actually be permanent. So I know we gave flexibility on signage, kind of outdoor dining, vending, kind of a new way of living. Some parts might make sense kind of in, even in the post-COVID world. So I'd love the EDA's thoughts on what uh, you think should stay. And then along the same lines of kind of how to position the city on the recovery point, um, this will be kind of, I guess, the third voice that kind of emphasizing the need to really market the city. I think there's kind of a unique opportunity for us to think about 
again, in that post-COVID world, not only is a city a great place to do business, but also a great place to live. And that line certainly gets blurred where people are going to be working where they live more. So I think the ED is in a great position to do that and help us. Um, I think before the pandemic, you all had worked on this really great marketing video. I don't know if we ever really launched it, but if we want to refresh kind of our social media presence, and really build a bigger audience, that feels like a great tool to use. Um, so I know you guys spent a fair amount of time on it. But uh, so generally, two thoughts. Thank you again for all your work. All right, thank you, Mr. Duncan, followed by, followed by Vice Mayor Connolly. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I just want to thank Bob uh, for your involvement in our Council's Economic Development Committee meetings every month and in uh, outside meeting uh, discussions and conversations. Uh, the big projects obviously uh, get the headlines, as they should. Uh, your Broad and Washingtons and your Tenor Hills and West Broads and Founders Rose and so forth. But, uh, you know, uh, we and you are involved in the three yards in a cloud of dust work, too. Uh, even in a, a pandemic year of 2020, uh, I'm struck by the fact that, you know, we had business openings at a pace that would make most uh, jurisdictions in the Commonwealth, if not America, uh, jealous uh, with openings like Solace Outpost and the new Volvo dealership uh, building and uh, uh, Conti Bikes relocating from the county into the city, Endocrinology Group buying 200 Park Avenue as part of a growing uh, medical use uh, market here in the city, 24-Hour Fitness reopened after being closed, uh, Toy Nest, Dogtopia, Bork G, Turkish Moms Cooking, Johnson's Cafe, and so on. Uh, those uh, uh, each are stories that are, uh, you know, stories of uh, somebody's uh, dream to build a business sometimes from the very ground up. Uh, we've got Preservation Biscuit coming uh, pretty soon and uh, Go Scramble, uh, the kids play area, as you know. Uh, and those stories are important stories, uh, not only economically for the city, but also to uh, sustain our uh, feeling as a community of being a place that's welcoming to small and medium-sized businesses as well as the larger developments. So thank you uh, for your efforts uh, and your other ADA colleagues and in, uh, in building uh, the community's uh, reputation in both regards. All right, Vice Mayor Connolly. Mr. Young and everyone on the EDA, I also just want to express my thanks and other people have said many things so I will associate myself with them and let you know how much we really do appreciate the hard work you are doing on behalf of the city to make it a better place for business and for people to visit thanks all right so I think that's pretty if much I everybody. Just, if I can just respond for a minute Dave yeah and then I'll be quiet um forever well maybe not um First of all, thank you for all those thank yous. It's very much appreciated. I wanna come back just for a moment to the communications. Letty mentioned <clears throat> the, um, the piece of software that we put together that we can't get out anywhere. Uh, we can't uh, manipulate our own website. Um, but another part of this whole communication thing is communication with our citizens. You all know better than most all the projects that have been undertaken and completed in the city, public works projects in particular. They never get any publicity. I think we owe it to the citizens to let them know what's going on and especially what we've accomplished. So I hope council, when it takes up budget, will take these kinds of things into consideration. Thanks for all your time. Very much appreciated. We appreciate the accolades. We'll be working hard next year. All right. Before we wrap up this conversation, let me just, uh, Bob, did you just leave? Uh, are you still with us? I'm with it. All right. So let me just follow up on two comments you just made. One about the web, you know, the website. You don't control your own website. What does that mean? It means just what I said. Um, we're not permitted to add things, subtract things. Um, that's all uh, handled by the Office of Communications, which as far as I can tell is heavily overloaded with many other things. Social media 
is not a priority as far as I can tell. Certainly ours isn't. Um, <clears throat> we, you know, we have, as you know, a weekly newsletter. I don't know how many people get it, but it appears to me that Letty's weekly news letters on Friday mornings reach a lot more people and probably are a lot more effective in letting people know what, what's going on. I just, so, I'm not sure that that's the right way for the city to be doing it. So with respect to the specifics of what you just said, do you, you saying you don't have control over um, your portion of the city website, do you seek that or do you just seek someone in staff to implement what you want to do on the website? Well, it would be great to have somebody on staff, but if we could just get access ourselves, we, we can easily find people who can do that, including people on staff, specifically, we hope, Naomi. Um, but we think it's a much bigger problem and ought to be attacked in that manner. Um, communications, you know, these days, um, an increasing part of our population uh, are folks who work almost exclusively with social media. You know, how's our Instagram account doing, folks? How, how about our Facebook account? I got to tell you, it's just pathetic. And I think it's critically important to economic development and generally to the city's communications. All right, I, I agree with you, Bob. And I tell you, it's that last mile. You know, you can do 99% of what you need to do, but then you don't communicate it effectively or you don't do the final, you know, that last mile of communication or outreach or interaction. And I'm, I'm sure, I know it's frustrating both to you and others as well. Uh, Mr. Shields, what, what, what say you as to what you've heard just now? So I, it is, a, I think, probably lots of dimensions to it, but it's fundamentally a resource issue. The EDA website was built by EDA staff when we had the marketing uh, staff member for the EDO, and um, we don't have that position anymore. So I think that's probably a fundamental uh, issue. Um, so it, it's a huge topic. I probably won't go on about it, but we could we can schedule time in the future to discuss it. I mean, I know you've heard this before from others as well about trying to up the game as far as the city's communication goes. And and so I think it would be worthy of, of, a, of a more in-depth conversation. Um, uh, we've just heard from the folks who specialize in economic development. And I, I think um, many of us also feel the same way that we really can do better or should do better or find a way to do better. So maybe we can table that for a different uh, day, but in the near future, maybe have a more in-depth conversation about how we as a city, um, particularly as it relates to economic development more, more broadly, can uh, communicate more effectively. All right, Mr. Young, we thank you very much. I uh, appreciate it. I know we'll be hearing more from you coming up here soon. Let's move on to council requests. Uh, are there any council requests? All right, let's move on to the report of the city manager, Mr. Shields. Sure. Thank uh, Mr. you, uh, Mr. Snyder. Yeah, Mr. Mayor. Before before we go on, um, I did want to respond to a couple of the uh, citizen comments that we received, um, particularly on the um, the, the school um, reopening. Uh, do we have any fresh information about that? Is that an issue that's been resolved yet, or is it still out there? Is your question re relating to the budget or to the school's plans themselves? We received a number of public comments um, requesting that council address the issue. Um, I mentioned those comments two weeks ago, and um, I think the citizens deserve a comment from us. I'm sure that the schools have responded, and I'm just trying to find out what the school response has been, whether the citizens, the issues that they've raised have been resolved or they're still out there uh, and the request for us to take action. Um, mostly my concern is that I wanna make sure that, that we are providing the schools all the resources and budgetary support they need to reopen as safely and rapidly as possible. So 
Um, and we may come to that later on. But I guess my question is, a number of citizens have written to us. They've been very strong messages. And I'm trying to figure out if their issues have been resolved or they're still out there. And it's something that city council needs to do other than just indicate reception of the comments. Well, I mean, I don't know, from my perspective, I'm not sure what there is to say. I don't know if there's resolution or not. I mean, to my understanding, there is a date for the schools to reopen, which is coming up later this month. I don't have the exact date at the top of, uh, top of my head, but it's later this month. Whether that's um, satisfactory to people or not, I believe there are choices. You know, you can choose to have your kids uh, continue virtual learning, a hybrid learning. There are, there are several choices parents elect. Um, and uh, to my understanding, that's a decision fully in the schools, the school board and the superintendent's ballywick, not ours. Um, so I'm not sure what else there is to say as to resources. I think we will hear later on about an additional request from the schools um, for CARES money. Um, but I don't, I'm not sure there's anything else I have to add. I don't know if Mr. Shields has anything uh, or Vice Mayor Connolly with her work in the schools that she would like to add. Vice Mayor Connolly. I can just add that um, the schools have announced to all parents and staff that the second vaccine for staff will be next Monday, which is President's Day, the 15th, uh, giving a week for the vaccine to take effect. Uh, schools will switch to hybrid mode Monday, the 22nd, with the first day on campus, Tuesday, the 23rd. And then all students will be offered the option of attending hybrid which I believe elementary school is four morning sessions or four afternoon sessions per week. And high school, secondary school is two full days per week. So the teachers will be teaching half of their class in person and half of their class online uh, at the same time using Aver cameras, which is definitely some very, um, futuristic progressive equipment that teachers are able to teach both in school and at home at the same time. We didn't have that technology before the pandemic. Um, the, some of the letters from the parents are requesting that the schools open five days a week for everyone quickly thereafter. And I think um, Dr. Newman, Dr. Newman is gonna address some of those concerns tomorrow at the school board meeting. But my understanding of it is that right now there's we're going to make sure that the hybrid mode works, that transportation works, that food services works, that we can get kids in and out of school learning to the best of their ability and um, and see what happens. So there are, you know, the parents that have sent us letters want everyone to open five days a week right away. And I think the schools are taking a, a more cautious look at that and saying, let's let's do what works now. We haven't been opened in almost a full year, which is a long time. And we haven't been open in a pandemic ever. So we want to make sure we can get as many kids into the classroom safely as possible. I think part of the problem with having all kids in school is that there isn't enough space in the building, uh, to f in, in most buildings, to fit every child every single day. So the fact that um, Falls Church Schools is able to open on the 23rd for students is because Dr. Noonan pressed so hard with Fairfax Health Department to get the vaccine. And we're the only school division where every staff member has been able to be vaccinated if they so desire. And I think the vast, vast majority have taken advantage of that. So we will be the first school division in Northern Virginia to reopen and, um, and hope that it keeps going well. I think one of the concerns is that even once school reopens, there will be cases and there will be a need to pause occasionally here and there. And one of the things the schools have said is that, you know, there will be robust contact tracing and there may be a need to close a classroom or a bus or a certain area of the school where there may have been contacts. And um, that's just something people are going to have to get used to and understand. So that's another reason why it makes sense to start in hybrid and just see how it goes. And it really is a community responsibility. You know, we're not going to be able to be open and stay open if there are huge outbreaks throughout the community. So um, I think that's really good news. Um, I think definitely some, I've responded to most of the people who sent us letters and a lot of them feel very strongly that they really would like their kids in school more than they are being offered at the moment and everyone's doing the best that they can. 
Hey, can I ask a follow on question of that, Mary Beth, since you sure. seem to have a pretty good grasp on um, where the schools stand with this? And this is further to, to Dave's comment. So that's the, the second or third time that I've heard this in the last week about this question of, of space. Um, yeah. And I was going to ask this question as it relates to wow. this CARES Act uh, funding that's coming out. So it it's at least as I understand it, um, the, the concern is not having adequate space. So I guess further to Dave's question, what resources uh, does council need to consider to get that space? And I guess my broader question is, it would be helpful to know as we deliberate the CARES Act funding as well as upcoming budget conversations, what exactly the schools need, meaning specifically, not just more space, but what is it, amount of square footage, so we can go out and make that happen? Because if that is the what what I'm hearing, the, the primary hurdle, if not the sole hurdle from a resource perspective, I'd like to be prepared to solve that problem. So does anybody have a a plan or details that they can bring to council so we can solve for that issue as opposed to just this kind of nebulous idea of needing more space without knowing what that is? Because yes, we can't we can't technically go in and operate the schools, but we can help solve for a problem with space if that is what is being put out there as the problem. Do yeah, we know what that just, is? Yeah, I'll give you just one example. There's a lot of different examples, but one of them is um, if a kindergarten class has 20 kids and the teacher has 10 kids in the classroom. You can accommodate a classroom with 10 kids, but then, so they're there at alternating times. But all of a sudden, when you're gonna fit 10, 20 kids into a kindergarten classroom with teachers, then that's more than you can safely distance six feet apart throughout the classroom. So then the question is, do you, could you find another space for those kids? But then who's the teacher? Because we only have a certain number of teachers. So it's that kind of capacity issue where you could indeed find a spot for every kid at Mount Daniel to sit in Mount Daniel Elementary School with six feet of space around them. But then how do you get them lunch and how do you feed them and how do you make sure that they're all safe and learning? Because the actual classrooms just won't hold 22 people. Does that make sense? So no, that's one of the issues. Another yeah. issue is um, when in the summer that we were talking about maybe being able to move people around and use the cafeterias for classroom space. Again, that could happen, but it's, it's just a matter of figuring out how many people we're going to have, how many parents want to have their kids back five days a week. Um, how many, so we need to know how many people that's going to be. And again, who's going to teach them if we need to separate them out and move them around. So it's, it's a logistical thing. And I think, yeah, there has to be, a lot more study and look at that. And I think once the schools do open, um, we will know better exactly how many kids are coming back and how they fit in the buildings and how they rotate through classrooms. Yeah. Does that make okay. sense? It, it does. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I feel like between para and teachers, we could, even if it's not an ideal situation, we could, we could deal with that, but not to, not to, to, digress back into the details of the operations, but I'm thinking beyond the school. So from a space perspective, if we've got the resource, teachers, paraprofessionals, whoever, if we need to, to look for resources, whether it's leasing space, opening up the community center, I mean, we have a brand new library that's delivering this summer, um, thinking beyond that. And then again, this is just further information that I would like, and maybe why you can relay this to the schools as it relates to our budget. But a lot of these folks that have written in, it's not just about getting people back five days a week. There are folks that are looking to make up for the lost education over the last year and then required about resources over the summer for all kids. And I, I haven't, and maybe that's something that'll be announced tomorrow or maybe it'll be discussed over the next couple of weeks. But I wanna go beyond thinking about um, just having this kind of general broad idea of resources and try to solve this problem as soon as possible uh, to go beyond you know, just thinking about the immediate infrastructure that we have, because I feel like we can solve these issues um, but but we need to have the information and, and data to be able to do that. And I, I'd personally like to have that as soon as possible from the schools on what they right. need specifically. Right. I do think, though, Ross, yeah. that some of some of those specifics are hard to know until you actually have this kids in the school trying to figure it out. So, for example, this morning I was at the middle school and I was a volunteer in the gymnasium and there were 46th graders who came 
to the middle school and they brought their computers and they set up for virtual learning. They were all spaced out in the bleachers. The school had put out stickers so that all of those kids would have a space that was six feet apart from everybody else and they would be safe. Um, and it went pretty well. But the kids sat down and then a couple of them said to me, is this where we're staying all day? <laughs> Don't we get to do anything else? And, and then they were in different class, you know, they were doing their own different virtual classes. So logistically it could, it worked okay. Um, and they were really happy to be there and they could kind of wave to their friends across and it was their very first day in middle school. So, you know, they weren't quite sure what to expect anyway. Um, and I think it, it did go well, but, but then you look at the logistics and go, Oh, wait, next time we have to do this a little better. And, ah, oh, we have to make sure that there's a cushion on the seat because the, you know, it's hard to sit on the bleachers all day long or whatever it is. So I think those logistics, as we bring kids back in these smaller groups, we're really going to see those and be able to go, Oh, okay. That's something we hadn't thought of. Let's make sure we cover that for the next thing. Or yeah, we do need space in the gym, extra space for PE class. So we can't, you know, we can't put all those kids in the class in the, P, the PE room all day long because we want to make sure we have kids that can use the gym. So I think those kind of things, you can make lots and lots of plans, but until you have the human beings in the space and seeing how they interact and what works, um, I think that that will be the next step. And that will start February 23rd. So I think that there will be a good chance to get a review of data and, and see how things are going. Okay. But I do, I understand what you're wishing for. And I also know that the, um, the governor has, is talking about additional funding for summer school. Right, Mr. Tarter. Yes. You heard that earlier. Yeah, he is. Yeah. He is. Yeah. So, so that is also something that um, may be available, and I'm sure the schools are taking a look at that as well. Yeah, I understand. I, yeah, I think folks are just looking for a plan. I mean, the kids have been out of school for almost a year, and so I, I understand some of it is going to be on-the-job training, so to speak, when we get kids back. But, you know, we, I, I feel like we probably need to present them with, with clear details and a plan. Um, because it's not like the kids have just been out of school recently. We've had we've had a year to deal with this, and I think that our constituents deserve more details than what they're getting right now. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. Yeah. All right. There's also information from the new uh, Secretary of Education at the state level about um, encouraging budget at the state level to be for um, testing. Right now, we can't do our own testing. The Fairfax County health department and the state don't, and VDOE don't support uh, individual school districts testing. So the new secretary of education is pushing for funding through that, through this next bill. And I think that is, uh, will be incredibly helpful for getting our students, more students back in school and containing um, the, the pause, keeping us from having to pause too frequently. So I'd like, I look forward to seeing more information on that too from the state level that's been tying our hands. So, Mr. Mayor, um, Dave Snyder, just, just a, a final comment. I want to thank all the council members who have commented. And I, I, I just wanted to let the folks know that have written to us that we are paying attention, we are listening, we are working as hard as we possibly can uh, to adjust all this. We appreciate the concerns of the parents, but we also think that teachers really want to teach and administrators really want to administer buildings filled with students. So finding the right course forward is what we're all trying to do. And I, my hope was that this conversation would illustrate that. And finally, in conclusion, let me say the obvious thing. The thing about COVID is that it is a thing. It does not respond to what we think, desire, or need. It can only be defeated by action. And again, thanks uh, for this conversation this evening, and we'll be following it up to see what else we need to do. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thanks to all the members of council who commented. All right, thank you. Let's move on to the report of the city manager, Mr. Shields. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'll just do a couple rapid fire updates for the city council. Uh, the first is uh, the good news that Big Chimneys Park is open. Uh, we are inviting the public back into that park after a long construction period. We will be doing promotion of that opening. We're putting together a video. It will be a virtual uh, opening ceremony for the park, um, and uh, we'll be promoting that. Uh, but I do just want to thank Danny Schlitt for all of his work to uh, get us through the design process with the community, uh, the Rec and Parks Advisory Board, 
and our project manager, Alice Dorga, who uh, managed this uh, construction project. So uh, welcome to the public, to Big Chimneys Park. It is a, it's a wonderful new addition to the city. Uh, on South Washington Street, uh, the construction there for the pedestrian improvements and the traffic uh, 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 signal changes and the uh, intermodal plaza um, is proceeding uh, with construction into a, a next phase this week. We'll have lane closures on Hillwood Avenue as we're continuing the work there. We're also pouring concrete on the sidewalks along the uh, the business frontages on the north side of Route 29. And once that concrete is down, then we can come back in behind to lay down the bricks and uh, the tree planters, et cetera. So the more visible parts, uh, the more visible improvements to that project um, are really starting to come uh, together. Uh, the uh, Stormwater Task Force is hard at work. They're meeting uh, on the 11th of February on the 24th of February and on the 11th of March. And then they plan to make their presentation to the city council on March 22nd on their recommendations for uh, some of the green infrastructure and other uh, uh, alternative ways to improve stormwater in the city. The council's already approved the capital improvements program for the major conveyance upgrades, um, and, and the focus of the task force now is on that second phase of work at the direction of the city council. So we're looking forward to their report to the city council on March 22nd. Um, the CIP was presented by Deputy City Manager Cindy Mester to the Planning Commission last week. All of the proposed CIP documents can be found on the city's webpage. Um, and that also will be presented to the City Council uh, come March 8th when the uh, overall budget is presented to the City Council. Uh, but that's our, our key way to plan for the future and all of the infrastructure and facilities uh, that we're looking forward to in the next six years through that CIP process. Uh, DPW, our, uh, our Robert Goff, as the Council knows, has announced his retirement this summer. And uh, we have put out a recruitment for his replacement, big shoes to fill, obviously. Uh, but I did want to just note that, that that recruitment is out. And so if anyone who's watching is interested in that position or if you know people who have the qualifications uh, to run our very important uh, operations divisions for our Department of Public Works, please let us know and, and uh, encourage people to apply. And then lastly, I'll just touch on uh, vaccine. Um, vaccine is the top rated or top piece of information on the city's webpage and the top feature of our biweekly COVID updates that we put out to the public, either through the eFocus or through the COVID updates that we, that we put out each week. Um, in terms of the key things for people to know, uh, the links on the city's webpage and in those Public communications have the instructions on what you need to do if you uh, wish to schedule your appointment, if you are currently in that eligible uh, group of either being older than 65 or have an underlying health condition that uh, puts you to the top of the priority list under the CDC's rules. Um, I would also uh, just note that we've, we've done hand flyers as well, and we've distributed those hand flyers Two populations that we know, um, uh, you know, like Winter Hill and other places where we know uh, that, that people need that information and might not be accessing it through digital means. Um, those are uh, a series of updates. I'd be happy to stop there and see if there are any questions. All right. Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Shields? We've got a few. Mr. Snyder, followed by Mr. Duncan. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, um, Wyatt, um, thank you for the work that we're all trying to do on the uh, vaccines. Um, so I'm aware of some of our citizens clearly fitting into the older age categories that have notified Fairfax Health and have gotten nothing back in almost a month. Um, I read conflicting information about the, the adequacy of the manufacturer of, of the um of the vaccines, um, 
clearly it, it's unsatisfactory. I mean, that's no surprise. Um, so what are the next steps that this council ought to take? And I know uh, Mayor Tarter has been working on this and Vice Mayor Connolly, but what additional steps? I plan to raise it at the Council of Governments Board of Directors again. Um, where's the, um, I'll try to say something printable here. Where's the problem um, with getting adequate vaccines out to our citizens and are the communications issues fixed um, with regard to folks who are in categories that um, are, are eligible? but are, are not being communicated with. So uh, again, it, it's not in any sense a blame on city staff or this council, but I'm trying to figure out what else we can do about this. Thank you. So just uh, uh, a couple of notes in response. Um, you know, fundamentally what the issue is is a scarcity of supply uh, but that scarcity of supply in the early days of this vaccine rollout was not quite that, you know, there are a couple of, of things that I think state policymakers did not fully um, understand when the vaccine was first being rolled out. Uh, two pieces of, of uh, bad data. One, they, I think they were told by the federal government that they, the federal government was, uh, had a stockpile that it would be releasing with a, a significant increase in, in a vaccine. Uh, that, of course, proved not to be the case. And then the second thing that they were, uh, you know, sort of bad information they were laboring under is because of the lags of reporting from the hospitals and from the, the public health uh, systems around the state through the, uh, uh, through the reporting system, there was an impression that was created that uh, that uh, the vaccine was sitting on shelves and not getting into people's arms. And this is really kind of the situation of about four weeks ago. And so the state greatly expanded the eligibility of, of, uh, of people who could get the vaccine uh, to the 1B group. And that overwhelmed uh, the communication systems that had been set up for a, a more gradual ramp up. That's the short story of a complicated tale that's caused a lot of frustration. Uh, the bottom line is uh, there's a backlog of 150,000 people who are registered in the Fairfax County Health District. And uh, Fairfax County is currently on a pace of about 18,000 vaccinations uh, in, in a week. So uh, sort of put those two numbers in context, 150,000 people registered, uh, clearing about 20,000 a week now. We do, uh, I think everybody is, hoping that that, uh, that more vaccine will be available and those numbers will grow. And I think incrementally that is the case. Um, in the meantime, uh, I do think the county is working hard to improve their web portal and at least the complaints that are coming in to my office and directly through uh, the city's webpage and, and, uh, and, and social media is that the complaints are you know, they are dropping as uh, I think particularly two weeks ago and a week ago, there was just a really uh, a lot of difficulty in, in getting the information that you need. And, and they, it's not perfect, uh, but I do think it is getting better. And I think the state's numbers, um, ac you know, across the board uh, are, are getting um, are, are improving. So let me just follow up. I understand the state went to some sort of a per capita distribution system that's disadvantaged Northern Virginia. All I'm trying to do is get to the bottom of what is the problem and where can we collectively or individually strive to do something about it? Because it's not working for a lot of people. And it can never work, it seems to me, as long as vaccines are only available to the public health departments and are not widely available throughout the private sector and healthcare providers. So. Anyway, I look forward to anything else that, that we can and should be doing, but it would be good to get a plan and a much more aggressive time frame than I think seems to be the case now. Thank you very much, Wyatt. I appreciate it. All right, Mr. Duncan. Um, I guess my question tracks that a little bit, so I'll not repeat. Um, uh, you know, I've sort of, 
uh, resign myself to the fact that it's going to be at least two months before uh, my turn would come up. Um, and that's, you know, just the way it is, I guess. Uh, the challenge is that you just don't have any idea that the, you know, note that you put in a month ago has been received. There was some information from the governor's office, uh, which I read somewhere. I can't remember. I'm reading enough stuff about this. I can't recall that they were going to fairly soon have, you know, the technological capacity to at least receive a phone call from uh, people who have registered uh, who want to know, did you get my registration? And, you know, am I in the month from now or the two months from now category. So as far as those of you who are in meetings where advice is given, I think that that would be a nice first step if you could just know that you didn't, you know, put the message in the bottle and it's floating out in the ocean and nobody's gotten it yet. Um, so that's one point. Second point is um, the CVS downtown appears to be doing some sort of a renovation. And I'm wondering uh, I've, I've read elsewhere that there will be a separate stream of vaccines uh, being issued uh, from the CVS stores across the Commonwealth, across the country. And I'm wondering if we have any new information on that or any advice to people, you know, should you put your name in at both places, you know, with Fairfax Health and CVS? Uh, does anybody know anything about that? Uh, we have been tracking that, and uh, the CVSs, uh, the last uh, last we checked, do not actually have vaccine yet, but it is on the way. And I think that is going to be a big part of the the real rollout of the vaccine when when the numbers really start to grow up. It will the um, the pharmacies will be a, a much larger player in the vaccination effort, and uh, and that always was the plan that in the early days when vaccine was scarce that the hospitals and the health departments would be the lead in uh, getting vaccination, uh, basically a highly rationed product. But once it, uh, the vaccine was uh, more prevalent, then you would lose use mass distributions through the pharmacies. Um, but at this point, uh, the vaccine doesn't exist, and so the, the pharmacies, pharmacies are not able to ramp up, but that, that will be happening. Okay, yeah, so well, just, just so we keep in touch with uh, the CVS folks here in town, the local folks here might, might turn to that as a, a place to go. That's right. I, I, mean, I suspect when the Johnson & Johnson vaccine becomes widely available, which it looks like it's several weeks off, You'll see that probably going to CVS's because it doesn't require the same sort of um, ultra freeze that, for example, the, the Pfizer vaccine um, does. As to your earlier question, too, about state rollout, the governor was on the regional call this afternoon, um, and the state has done a soft opening of their like regional call center and their regional, or not regional, statewide call center and statewide um, website. They didn't want to go full bore right at the very beginning. Maybe the system would crash. So they're anticipating that to be up and running fully next week. So I would just stay tuned on that front. Um, it looks like from best we can hear, there is not an eminent increase in the amount of vaccines that's going to be available for at least the next couple of weeks. I think the Johnson & Johnson product, uh, when that becomes available, will be a uh, figurative and literal uh, shot in the arm for the um, <laughs> for the process, but that's just not there yet. Okay, thanks. Ms. Hardy? Great, thank you. Um, while we're on CVS, I think I read that not every CVS is gonna get vaccines, and so they're allocating it based on kind of equity and making sure it was distributed across the state. Um, mm -hmm. So like, stay tuned, I guess, basically, for citizens who may be watching. I think not every CVS around will have it. Um, Dave, you mentioned the state website and registration system. One of the questions I've already fielded is, it's good that the state's going to roll out kind of a centralized system. Hopefully it's better than what we've had to date, but people won't want to re-register, or at least I'll have a question of whether they'll need to re-register. So that would be good to get out in communications of whether all the information in the existing health department systems does transfer to the state one. Otherwise, you're going to have people calling the call centers confused what to do. Um, along the lines of communication, so in general, I do agree that things have at least settled down a bit compared to two weeks ago, but I do continue fielding questions about kind of priority of city residents versus uh, the greater county. And so I think why, to the extent that, you know, as we continue communicating about vaccines, continue emphasizing that city residents are treated equally and serve equally, 
um, in that kind of 150,000 long queue, it's not like we're going to be last in line. I think that's helpful and reassuring to our citizens. Um, and then my last uh, request around communication is um, I really appreciate the weekly emails that we get around COVID, um, but I would like to think that we can actually transition to um, using positivity rate and per capita vaccination rates rather than raw numbers. Because I think as the numbers get bigger, they just mean less. Uh, and I think using positivity rate and actually per capita vaccination rate might be a better way to actually monitor where we are in the city than absolute raw numbers, which we've done for the past 11 months now. Yeah, those numbers should be available. I mean, as well. I mean, I don't know what numbers we're using as a city to push out, but the the those those rates are available. Yep, and I look at them every week. But I know that in the city, we've been reporting, and it, when, the, when the numbers were small, it, you know, it was helpful. But now they're big enough that I think using positivity and per capita vaccinations a more helpful indicator. Got it. Yep. Great. Thank you. Thank you for that. Any thank other you. questions or comments regarding the city manager's report? All right. Why don't we move on to business on the agenda, Madam Clerk? Yes, thank you. We have some resolutions and first readings of ordinances. The first one is TR 21-01, resolution to endorse the City of Falls Church fiscal year 2022 to 2027 application for Regional Service Transportation Program, RSTP funds. Mr. Shields. Well, thank you. And Mr. Bradley's on the call and uh, Caitlin Sobsey's on the call as well. I'm not sure which one of you wants to handle this item. I'll take it, Wyatt. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Uh, so tonight, uh, staff is making the recommendation to adopt TR21-01. Uh, this is this uh, resolution is for council to endorse the application that city staff submitted back in January for RSTP funding. Uh, the RSTP funding amount was $550,000, um, and it can be used for any of our CIP projects uh, that either repair or improve pedestrian, bicycle, bridge, or traffic calming facilities throughout the city. And the funding that was applied for will be available in FY27. Um, so even though this is a six-year CIP, that is the funding year that the $550,000, I should clarify, up to $550,000 uh, will be awarded. Uh, the funds are, or the application is submitted to NVTA, uh, who makes a recommendation to the CTB, who ultimately determines the actual distribution and actual funds allotted. Um, so again, we've requested 550,000. Um, we don't always get that much, but we have always gotten something um, since 2013. So. Uh, Let's see, since 2013, uh, we've requested between 300,000 and 550,000 every year. Again, we've, we've always been awarded um, a significant amount. I believe last year's award uh, was just a little over $400,000, um, just to give you an idea of, of how much we do get. And uh, again, you know, the, these funds are used for anything pedestrian related, sidewalks, crosswalks, uh, they could be cyclists. Um, and traffic calming uh, projects. Okay, and, I think yes. that's, I think that's it, right? It is. Uh, I just one more note okay. that um, the timing we are requesting action tonight. Uh, council does have to endorse the application by February nineteenth, uh, but other than that, that is it. All right. All right. Any questions, comments? Do we have a motion? We do have a question. Yeah, just right. adopt TR 21-01. All right, second. do we have a second? Snyder seconds. All right, so Ms. Hardy on the motion and Mr. Snyder on the second. We've got a couple comments. Before we take those, Madam Clerk, is there any public comment? There is not. All right, uh, Mr. Let me just see, uh, Vice Mayor Connolly, did you have a comment? Yeah, I just have a quick question for Mr. Bradley. and. The last couple of years, Ms. Hardy has done such a great job of leading the community charge to get public comment to support some of our grant applications. And I know these are a bit in the future, but are there any of these that will require community support to be able to get through? That same kind of letter writing and public comment? Uh, I, I will defer to uh, Ms. Sobsey on that one. I am not 100% sure on that. 
Yeah, Zach, I can let you know. For RSTP funds, um, we don't typically take public comments. The funds are uh, estimated on a per capita basis. So um, the city sort of just gets the amount that they get. Last year, uh, like Mr. Bradley said, we received $434,000 and we also requested $550,000 that year. Um, so we don't typically submit public comments for this. Um, it's their federal funds allocated through the state. We will be um, uh, accepting and submitting some public comments um, for one of our next uh, pending grant applications, which is the Smart Scout application for the South Washington bus stop expansion. That's great. Thank you, Ms. Sopsy. All right, any other comments or questions? We have a motion and a second. Madam Clerk, will you go ahead and uh, take the vote here? Yes. Ms. Conley? Yes. Mr. Duncan? Yes. Ms. Hardy? Yes. Mr. Lickenhaus? Yes. Ms. Shantz Hiscott? Yes. Mr. Snyder? Yes. And Mayor Torter. Yes. Motion carries seven to zero. Thank you, Council. All right, will you call the next item? I will. I can find it. And while you're doing that, after this next item, we'll take a short break, if that's all right with everyone, a short recess uh, to recharge and, and the like, and come back after that. So let's go ahead with this item, though, Madam Clerk. Yes, we have TR 21-03, resolution providing direction to the city manager on the allocation of Broad and Washington project voluntary concessions to affordable housing. All right, uh, Mr. Shields, who's handling this? Um, I'll give a summary, and uh, I believe we do have Nancy Vincent on the, on the call, and she um, can add to it as well of anything that I missed. Uh, but with the Broad and Washington project, the City Council um, did negotiate a basket of community benefits, uh, to uh, all of which have a nexus to that development, uh, to either mitigate impacts of the project or to provide uh, community benefits. Um, and uh, principal among those benefits is a, a voluntary concession of affordable housing. And in that, uh, there were 18 units that were sort of the base case of, uh, of an affordable housing contribution from this project. Um, of those 18 units, nine were to be affordable for people making 40% of area median income, and those would be studio efficiencies, and, uh, and nine more would be uh, two-bedroom units for people or households at 60% of the area median income. In addition to that, there's a, an, an option within the voluntary concessions that were proposed by Insight Development Corporation in which uh, there could be up to 10% of the units of, of the project could be made uh, affordable. Um, but uh, to do so, there'd be a trade-off of some of the other cash proffers that were also offered in the voluntary concessions. So what this resolution does is direct staff to uh, seek 15 additional affordable units, uh, efficiencies at 60% AMI, so that uh, overall the project will have 10% of the units would be um, at, at some level of affordability uh, below market rate and uh, provides further direction that uh, the uh, sort of the purchase of those units, if you will, would come from the voluntary concessions uh, VC number six, which was uh, the, uh, uh, an offer of $2.298 million for school capital costs, and VC number 13, which is $153,000 for library costs. If, uh, if the council acts on this resolution, and, uh, and that is the plan that we follow, there still will be $87,000 of voluntary concessions uh, between VC6 and VC13, which uh, would be split between those two uses. So that's a quick overview of the resolution and what it does. The timing for this is, you know, we would uh, convey this immediately to the developer, but the, uh, then staff would ensure that that is reflected 
in the site plan documents, which were expected sometime this summer, probably in the June time frame when, uh, when the site plan will be submitted. I'd be happy to answer any questions. And uh, uh, Ms. Vincent, uh, our Housing Human Services Director, is also on the call. And if I missed anything, I hope she will uh, make note of it. And I do right. want to, um, I'm, I'm, excuse me. Go ahead, please. I, I do want to clarify that the 15 additional studio units would be uh, affordable to households at 80% uh, of the area median. Okay. Income, Thank you for that correction. I had said 60%. It will be at 80%. That's right. All right. Thank you very much. We've got a few comments here. Mr. Duncan Bean first, followed by Mr. Lichtenhaus. Hi, thank you, Mayor. Uh, just a question about the $87,000. So that's what's left over, uh, as you said, Mr. Manager. Uh, looking at the cost of a 80% <clears throat> AMI studio unit uh, being $157,000. So does that mean we're only, if we apply that $87,000, we'd only be $70,000 short of uh, having uh, another uh, AMI uh, 80% studio unit is, is, am I doing my math right? I mean, what, what I'm trying to get at here is I think most people know who've talked with me about this is, you know, a true 10%, uh, there's 339 units in the building in total. And so a true 10% actually would be 34, not 33, 33 is great. Don't get me wrong, but I, it, we're just tantalizingly close to being able to do, 34 and a true 10 percent is uh, is my math right at least as to, as to the merits of the of the suggestion i'll i'll leave it to others thoughts but uh, is my math correct mr manager your math is correct okay well i would i would like for uh folks to comment at least on the possibility that uh we uh arrange this so that we can get that 16th uh unit and get a true 34 10 percent uh, which uh, would be a, a good, a great marker for, for this project, I think. Thank you. All right, Mr. Lichtenhaus, followed by Ms. Conley. Well, I, I had a great idea until I heard Phil. Um, I was actually going to suggest that uh, that money go towards the stormwater fund to offset um, the expected fee increase in a couple of years. Uh, I'm still very, very concerned about um, what is a little further down the road. And so every dollar we can put towards that obligation, I would like to do that. But uh, Councilman Duncan, that is also a, uh, a a worthy idea. All right, Vice Mayor Connolly, followed by Ms. Hardy. Thanks, Mayor Tarter. Um, Mr. Shields, my question on this one, it just as a follow-up to my request when we discussed this at work session last week, which is, is that can you make can we put up on the website and make a public document of how we have received and used voluntary concessions in every project that we've had them, so that people who are looking at this for this project as well as the next project, and the one after that understand the arc of how we have received voluntary concessions, what we have used them for, why we have used them for certain things at certain times and what kind of funding we still have available or are expecting from projects like Founders Row. So that the next time we have a project presented to us, there'll be this whole history of voluntary concessions available for community members as well as the developer proposer to see what has happened in the past and what we expect from them in the future. I think that would also go a long way to explain to the community that we're not taking money from budgets we're actually just allocating the money within the CIP in a way that meets overall city plans uh, but yes that that document will be a living document and will be available and we'll keep it updated that's great I think that's really important just for community education so that people can find it understand it because it takes a while to understand so it's good to have it there and accessible thanks all right uh, Miss Hardy followed by Mr. Snyder Thank you. Um, a request for staff. So I think it's in our resolution, but um, assuming that this passes tonight, um, if we can have a specific action to figure out uh, how we prioritize some of these units for teachers or uh, general government employees, I think it's kind of called out 
in lines kind of 82 to 85, but I think there's probably some lessons learned on how we've administered the programs in the past, and I want to make sure that we learn from that going forward. And I would defer to Ms. Vincent on that question. So, so um, there is an um, affordable dwelling unit policy that sets out what the priorities will be. And the, uh, the priorities uh, are, are first uh, folks who live or work in the city of Falls Church with uh, seniors and people with disabilities coming to the, rising to the top of that list. Then, then uh, the, uh, the next priority would be for uh, folks outside of the city of Falls Church. And uh, th there, there is not for the affordable dwelling unit program, a specific priority for teachers or for staff who work for the city of Falls Church, but rather for, uh, at any business in, the Fall, in Falls Church. There are specific teacher workforce units at the Reed building that do give that priority. Um, there are nine, uh, nine apartment homes there that give priority to teachers, uh, to uh, school staff and to city government staff. So, so we do have experience uh, with, with both, but the, in general, the affordable dwelling unit program um, is more general towards city residents and uh, any city employee. So I guess what I would request then is let's understand what the demand might be from teachers and general government employees and then potentially add that, um, I guess, preference in the affordable development program, similar to how we have the teacher workforce unit program. Okay. Thank All you. right, Mr. Schneider. Sure, um, thank you. Um, so um, the, um, the issue of affordable housing is not a new issue for me. I've worked on it for many decades and um, I always look forward to how we can get more of it consistent with our other um, pressing city needs. Um, I started talking about and with other council, at least one other council member last fall about raising our um, expected number from 6% to 10% with new development projects. Um, my view had always been that that would be in addition to other VCs. And I would note that school capital costs are well documented and well justified and um, that money will be needed um, for the schools um, and it all comes out of the taxpayers' pockets. But to get back to the major point here, um, I had always, my preference had always been that we not rob Peter to pay Paul, that we um, would add this on and use uh, our leverage uh, with developers. Um, Two weeks ago, I made an attempt to achieve that objective to build this as an additional, that is the increase in affordable dwelling units over and above the VCs. That motion failed to get a second and was never debated. Um, the die then was cast by those actions two weeks ago. So uh, while this is not my preferred approach, um, I think that we should demand more um, of affordable dwelling units, but not at the cost of school capital costs and other uh, VCs going forward. I even suggested it as part of the response to Mill Creek's proposal at Founders Row. Their, their issues that they raised with us, that also failed to get support. So I want folks to understand that yes, I support um, increase in affordable de dwelling units, uh, this is not at all my preferred uh, or desirable <laughs> approach to, um, to funding them. I think we had other opportunities that, that were not taken. Um, that's my view. Um, so um, I will probably be voting for um, this, um, this resolution, um, but um, with some reluctance and the hope that in the future we can be better negotiators. Thank you. All right, thank you. Madam Clerk, is there any public comment as to this matter? I have not received any public comment. All right. Mr. Duncan, did you have another comment? I did not. I just want to know when we're going to make a motion because I'd like to 
offer some thoughts on the motion. All right. Well, I think now would be the time to make a motion. Someone like to okay, make a motion? Well, Someone I would like to. Phil? I would like to, if I may. Of course you uh, I, I would like to, I would like to move to adopt TR 21-03. Um, and uh, I would like to uh, include in that, in that motion uh, that VC number six and VC number 13, uh, the president of VCs be used in total for the ADU component of this deal. And that if uh, that amount of money falls short of being able to purchase, to use the phrase that was uh, employed earlier, a 16th studio at 80% AMI that council authorize use of up to, but not to exceed $70,000 from the proceeds of the city parking lot uh, into the ADU component of the deal. All right, uh, before we, uh, do we have a second? Mayor, I'll second. All right. And Mr. Shields, that's what Mr. Duncan just proposed is consistent with the site plan, uh, or not the site plan, I'm thinking Arlington, the uh, VCs associated with our spe special exception, correct? They don't exceed the amount uh, in any form that's in the uh, voluntary concessions? That's correct. Okay. All right, so we have a motion and a second. Um, is there any further discussion? Should we to go through the vote? Mr. Merrill, I apologize. I missed the middle of Mr. Duncan's motion um, because of audio. Um, I got the end. I got the end part. I just didn't get the the mid the midsection after VC number six and VC number thirteen. Okay, apply, apply VC six and thirteen fully into the ADU component of the deal. Okay. That's what I missed. Thank okay. you. Thank you. All right. Are we ready to go to a vote? Mayor, I just had wanted to offer a comment. All right. Go ahead. Um, I wanted to refer to the matrix. I don't know if it's linked in the staff report, but I think it was in our last package. But the new report that the EDO had put out that kind of showed the history of voluntary concessions and compared the broad in Washington um, concessions were receiving uh, or received compared to the historical ones. And so while we can always do better, I thought that was actually a really helpful document because essentially the, the sum of it was that what we're getting in Broad and Washington is probably the richest mix um, and largest contributions in VCs across the board. So while we can always do better, I do wanna make sure that people understand that we are getting a lot from this project. And while um, everything, you know, there are a lot of priorities in there, I think it is our job to make trade-offs because otherwise if everything is a priority, then nothing is a priority. So I do think it's appropriate for us that we do turn our attentions with the VCs that we're getting that are very generous to areas that have received a lot of attention to date and really move it towards affordable housing. Thank you. Mary, you're muted. I would, uh, I don't know if Mr. Duncan has his hand up or not, but I, I guess I would just agree as well and, and note that uh, mixed use and some of the development we've done of these past years has allowed us um, to provide so many services to our community and so many benefits to our community. The affordable housing that'll be provided in this project that I'm, that I'm happy to support because it's the right thing to do um, is just one of the many examples um, and uh, we haven't even got to the store being opened yet. So there's so many things that uh, development has brought to this community these past years and so many more things to make this a complete and vibrant downtown. I'm very excited about this project, but the, the possibility of having um, increased affordable housing and raising the bar in that area is one that I think is very exciting um, for our community. But Mr. Duncan, did you have something you wanted to say? I just wanted to thank you for your comments and Ms. Hardy's and say that in the long and checkered history of an attempt to bring affordable housing downtown, uh, you know, going back 20 years ago, there was a proposal to use this very property, part of it, um, for a parking deck and two stories of affordable housing above it. So it's taken us 20 years 
to get back to, you know, fulfilling that vision that we had then. And the key ingredients in being able to accomplish that were that we had to meet other needs. I mean, we just did. That's what that's what I learned from uh, past councils that were reluctant to support affordable housing. Um, you know, we had needs for schools and library and parks and city hall. And uh, I'm proud to say uh, that you all on council have met all those needs. There's certainly more to come, but those, meet, those needs have been uh, aggressively met in recent years. And then the second thing we had to do is drive a hard bargain in these mixed use projects. And as the mayor said, we have, and the vice mayor also, we've gotten millions, tens of millions of dollars of proffers in multiple areas because we have driven a hard bargain with developers and we continue to do that with this project. Uh, and because of our uh, ability to do that, we are now find ourselves in the position to accomplish this very important goal, uh, which is to bring affordable housing in very meaningful numbers uh, to our downtown. That's just the start of big things. You know, we've got the Atlantic proposal in Southwest, West Broad, and West Falls Church. This marker down that I think future councils will be able to use as a starting point for their negotiations with uh, applicants who bring proposals for major developments to the city. So thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. All right, well, let's go ahead to the vote unless there's any other comments to be had. Madam Clerk? Ms. Conley? Yes. Mr. Duncan? Yes. Ms. Hardy? Yes. Mr. Lickenhouse? Yes. Ms. Shantz Hiscott? Yes. Mr. Snyder? Yes. And Mayor Tarter? Yes. Motion carries seven to zero. Thank you. All right, thank you. So we've been at it about two hours and I suggest we take a short recess and then get back at it uh, for the rest of our agenda. You may recall that we do have a closed session tonight as well. So we do have a fair amount of work to go, but it's now 926. I propose we get back together at, um, how about we say 932. So let's give ourselves a full five minutes, 932 if we can, okay? All right, we'll reconvene then. Okay, thanks. Are we, so we're back live. Yes. All right, welcome back everyone. We're reconvening after a short recess. Thank you for your patience and indulgence. Madam Clerk, why don't you go ahead and call the next item then? Sure. We have a TO 21-02. Uh, ordinance to amend. Nope, I skipped one. I knew this was the wrong one. Excuse me. Let me start over. We have TO 21-01, ordinance to amend, reenact, and recodify Chapter 14, Environment, Article 3, Noise, of the Code of the City of Falls Church to remove provisions defining violations as those that disturb a reasonable person, create an exception for small power equipment operation during daytime, and allow longer daytime hours in commercial and industrial districts. All right, thank you. And Mr. Shields, who's going to do uh, the staff report? So um, what we'll do is, <clears throat> I think if I could just say a few words by introduction, uh, we do have uh, Captain Steve Rao on the call and Chief Gavin, who uh, do have information just about the numbers and how we go about enforcing this right now, which I, I think would be helpful to council, some council members who have asked these questions. We've gotten a lot of public comment on this ordinance, and uh, we also have Jim Snyder on the call. Uh, the EDA uh, did discuss it at their meeting, and I think the Chamber of Commerce also uh, has is aware of the ordinance moving through the process. Um, I'll just note, um, and, and um, City Attorney Carol McCoskery might actually, let me turn it over to you, maybe just to hit the changes we made to the ordinance in response to the work session uh, prior to this meeting. And then from there, go to the police just uh, for a, a, a briefing for the city council on how this ordinance is enforced today, just so we all have that 
uh, information. Uh, the request tonight is just to take first reading on this, and we do expect that we will continue to get public comment on it and, um, and possibly gather some more information, and there could be amendments uh, prior to final action if council does take first reading tonight. Um, City Attorney McCoskery, do you want to just review the changes? Sure. And I will also mention Jack Villa is on the phone again tonight yeah. with us. He's been helping us out. Um, he was going to do a very brief run through of the five standard change or six standard changes, but we may not get to that tonight. Um, but I think everyone's aware of how helpful he has been. There are um, two changes that are currently in the version for advertising that uh, you did not see before, but were discussed. First at lines 118 to 120, um, daytime hours on Friday, Saturday, and local holidays in business and commercial districts would be extended to um, 10.30 p.m. Now, I chose that time. There was discussion of a few different times. Understand that it would be important to change that 10.30 p.m. if you wanted it to be later, because otherwise we might have to go back and re-advertise. So if council wants to consider 11 p.m., then we should you should just give that direction as part of the motion tonight. That's the first change is to extend those hours for um, only in business and commercial zoning districts to allow for um, the kinds of entertainment that we've been seeing that people want to do. The second change is related to lawn equipment and small power equipment. It's at lines 288 to 290, and it would allow, it creates an exemption for lawn maintenance and small power equipment for up to three hours in any 24 hour period. So this is, an, this is designed to make sure that people can mow their lawns and blow their leaves out of the way and do their lawn cleanup without um, concern about violating the noise ordinance. It's the kind of thing that I think has technically been a violation, but is generally not enforced because it's temporary, but this makes that clear. So these are the two changes that we've made um, since what you saw last time. And I think um, the police do have some information about violations and how they've been handled and how many there have been in the past. So if Steve Rao, I don't know if you want to go over those or, or why, if you want to handle that. This I, is, oh, go ahead, Chief. I was going to say, I do have the statistics. If you, if uh, I'll take the statistics and Steve, you can talk about, I guess, enforcement if you'd like, if, if that's what you want, Wyatt. Sure. Let's go with it. Okay. So we ran the statistics for the last 13 months um, to date, and um, overall, uh, the police department has responded to 246 noise complaints. In that time period, uh, um, or those numbers, 124 of them are res residential, and then 102 of them are commercial, and then there's 20 others, and that would be cars or people passing by uh, locations not necessarily attached to a certain address. Um, of course, in the city, we have um, commercial hotspots. And a lot of these hotspots were born out of, uh, as uh, Steve Rao had suggested last um, council meeting, was born out of the COVID conditions. And um, we do have uh, four restaurants that have... Um, We've been to several times, obviously, uh, the Falls Church Distillery, which uh, borders a residential zone there. Um, we've gone there 35 times. Uh, Leslie's um, restaurant there on Hillwood, 11 times. State Theater, four times. And Liberty Barbecue, three times. Um, those are all loud music um, calls. Um, in addition to that, in the commercial zones, um, we have gone to, for instance, the Kensington BJs and Giant for various different um, noise violations. And those are typically um, when people are picking up or um, dropping off trash, unloading um, 
in the early morning hours. Um, and then the giant has two generator um, type uh, noise uh, violations. Um, as you move through the, the city, uh, the other types of complaints that the police department responds to in terms of noise complaints is um, throughout the city, some equipment are loading, and that usually has to do with construction sites. Uh, the women's clinic up at the south, uh, 900 block of South Washington Street, occasionally we will get protesters out there with bullhorns, and we're called out to that. Uh, we've only actually had um, that I that I could see one called in commercial lawn um, company that was complained on, and um, all in all, the residential type complaints are more along the lines of loud parties in homes, car alarms, and a handful of barking dogs. Um, because of the uh, the nature of the um, ordinance and it being, I guess, deemed uh, constitutionally un, unable to uh, to enforce the, the what we have done is uh, taken the stance of when we get a noise complaint, what we typically do is we uh, go to the residents, you know, I identify um, that there is a complaint, we seek compliance, and most of the time we do get compliance. Um, you give them verbal warnings. In the uh, past several months, we have been um, issuing uh, written warnings because we have uh, acquired a, uh, a noise meter, and so we can measure it. and uh, And the measurements, I'll talk. I'll let Steve to pick it up from here. in In terms of how operations is uh, monitoring the the community with the noise meter. Uh, so this is Captain Rouse. What we're trying to do with the with the noise meter um, is we we have the matrix, uh, so to speak, that is uh, embedded in the ordinance in the in the city ordinance, and um, that that lists what we do is for uh, for continuous sound levels. So what we try to do is. Um, have uh, have my officers get uh, knowledgeable on the use of the noise meter, and when we're uh, when we receive noise complaints, uh, I've asked that they take uh, readings from three different locations. Uh, so, in in essence, if they go to the distillery, they'll take a reading uh, across the street. And and part part of this is that the readings are done. Uh, across the boundary line such that that's what the ordinance asks. Uh, that's what the, the violation of the law is across the boundary line. So they'll go across the street. Uh, they will go to the corner of uh, Tinner in North Washington, and they'll go to the corner of uh, Tinner and Maple. And that's just given the example of the distillery and take three different readings. Um, and, if, uh, if in fact, uh, recently, if they've been in violation, we've, we've issued uh, uh, written warnings uh, to them, uh, knowing, knowing the process that we're, what we're going through right now. Um, so what, what I'm trying to do is just so that we're not, uh, we're not taking a reading, uh, what I would say, directly in the line of sight of any, of any device emanating music. You know, we're trying to we're, we're we're trying to get an overall picture of what we're hearing and what the citizens are hearing. Um, I will put a plug in right now to say that uh, the uh, with the amount of of uh, citizen feedback that the council has received, I would I would ask the citizens that that when they do call for a noise violation is that uh, to meet with us because a lot of times they they don't want to meet with us. And I think a true reading inside of inside of a residence or anything like that would be real helpful. All right, thank you. Why don't we go ahead and open it up to questions? Council comments. Council members. Ms. Hiscott, followed by Ms. Hardy. Uh, thank you for all that uh, data. That's helpful information. When you have done the more recent, you know, since you've had the decibel reader and you've gone out and taken these um, 
tests from multiple sites, uh, you know, is the, um, I guess I'm looking, thinking about the range we have for acceptable decibel readings, uh, six, roughly 65 to 85 decibels. Uh, there's been concern expressed that that is, could essentially be someone who talks really loudly or, or not, a, you know, a single drum, if you had outside music, would exceed that decibel reading. And I'm wondering if that's what we found, what you found when you've used the decibel reader out uh, and about in the past couple of months, Captain Rao. Uh, so, yes, we have found, we, we have found uh, that the, the, that the readings are higher than the, per, than the permitted 65 or 70, whatever it is at the time. Uh, again, understand someone talking lowly or a single drum beat at 75 feet is not going to register at 75 decibels. Uh, we're not, we're not putting the noise meter right up to a, an amplified speaker where we're going across the boundary line, uh, wherever that boundary line may be. So they, we have seen them in violation. I would say that as high as, as, uh, oh, 80, probably, probably 80, 85 decibels, uh, would be a, a single time. Uh, but the, but around the 80 range, I would, I would say on some, uh, on some evenings. Just trying to get an uh, understanding of what, you know, the number of complaints we've received in the volume versus what our code actually says that range, acceptable range is. Um, just heard differing opinions on that, so I appreciate your data points there. Okay. Ms. Hardy, followed by Mr. Lichtenhouse. Thank um, So I think the thing we're, trying, we're struggling with is how to balance flexibility for the businesses um, who are struggling during this pandemic um, and follow the rules with the ones that don't follow the rules. Um, so Captain Rao, for the calls that you've made, so it sounds like um, about half of them are split roughly between commercial and half for residential calls for service. Um, for the commercial ones, um, do you find that they are because of decibel level, people saying it's too loud, or things are exceeding past the current daytime hours or both? Uh, when it comes to music complaints, um, I would say mostly it's the um, it, it is the volume of the noise. Uh, now there's there's been some debate as to what the uh, how late they've been allowed to um, to operate. Okay, be it nine o'clock or ten o'clock, uh, but uh, I think a lot of it has to do more so with the volume uh, than with the time frame. And when you've had to respond um, to these service calls, what's the normal kind of procedure? Do you kind of issue the verbal warning and then you might get a call back later on, you might not? Do we have any fines or kind of what, how do we step up the enforcement beyond that verbal warning? Well, the, the next thing would be just uh, what, what we've done a lot before in the past is, you know, you show up, you give a verbal warning, and a lot of times that, that gains the compliance um, and, and the... Uh, the record of that is just our notes in our computer aided dispatch. You know um, what we what what we have done uh, over the last couple months is I've asked my people to at the very minimum write a written warning, uh, which is it's it's just like a summons, but it's a warning. Okay, so that we have a uh, we have a more concrete record of the date, time, and uh, and who we actually issue the the written warning to. Um, but there, there is no, uh, there's no penalty for a written warning. I guess is what I can say. So there's no fine. It's not like you get a ticket and you have to pay X amount of dollars because you've gotten a fine for exceeding the decibel levels or going past nine o'clock currently. No, that that's that's where again we're warning and we're trying to gain compliance. Uh, we're we're trying to uh, inform and educate and uh, ask ask these businesses to to you know to be good neighbors to everybody and we're trying to gain compliance got it um have we had issues with repeated violations so whether it's the same night or back-to-back -back nights or one week and then the next week same thing happens again I, definitely we get the the repeat violations on a, on a weekly basis uh we do get some sometimes in in different areas we get repeat violations on the same night 
um, you know, you show up and, you know, it may, the volume may go down for a bit and they may turn it back up. But uh, I, I don't have that data in front of me and I don't want to speak to it, uh, you know, a lot if I don't have it in front of me. And I guess the question both for both you and maybe the city attorney is, is there anything in our ordinance today that provides for giving us authority to levy fines? to be able to step up essentially the enforcement action. So, I mean, speaking in, obviously in the times of COVID, the last thing I want you and your team to do is have to make all these calls for service, right? We don't want you having to interact um, with members of the public. Um, it's certainly not a great use of your time either, especially, you know, putting you at risk of, you know, getting COVID. Ms. Hardy, we can actually take a person into custody for violating the noise ordinance as written today. Okay. okay. We could uh, theoretically, we could receive a complaint, go down there, see that it's over uh, over the decibel limit as set. We could issue them a summons. They mm -hmm. could say, well, I already got one summons, so let me turn it up again. We could go back there an hour later, and by refusing to discontinue the unlawful act, we could actually arrest the, the, the person responsible for that. We could take them into custody, take them to jail. Um, that is the draconian you know, uh, answer to to this, which is, again, we're trying the inform and educate uh, model. Yeah, and I appreciate that kind of community based policing where, you know, you want obviously you want to partner with our businesses. But I guess what I'm looking for is somewhere in between. Right. So I would hate for you guys to continue having to make these calls out only to, you know, find that you're just getting called back out again. But on the other hand, we're certainly not going to go arrest people for this. So what's in the middle and what does the ordinance provide for? that we can actually do better enforcement kind of somewhere in the middle between that. Well, the, what's in the middle is we can just continue. We can issue them a summons. We don't have to take them to jail, but we would, they, they would be facing a class one misdemeanor charge in court. Um, you know, uh, the lawyers out there all know, I mean, it's the, the maximum punishment on a class one misdemeanor is uh, a year in jail or a $2,500 fine. That's, that's that's not what gets levied in court for a first time offender. But but the what it does is issuing a summons actually brings them before, you know, a judge to to answer for what's going on. And, and I and I think that, you know, as a natural trajectory, if we had someone who is a repeat violator and we had issued summons after summons and we had gone to court a few times, the fines would probably get higher and ultimately we could seek some injunctive relief to stop a repeated violation as a public nuisance. So that would be the ultimate way to address the problem if it never got fixed. And so I think there are some ways to you know, the first, as as Captain Rao has pointed out, the first penalty a court would impose would not be a $2,500 fine and a year in jail. But after someone had violated a couple times, a court would be more sympathetic to imposing more of that fine for the next violation. Got it. And out of the 264 noise complaints that the chief quoted, we've never gone so far as to issue a summons, correct? I do not believe I, uh, I can't answer that. I we may have. Um, uh, I, I will tell you after reading after reading all of the 49 pages of them, um, <laughs> the only um, noise ordinance that we have enforced is the trash trucks uh, because we actually caught them um, in process. And uh, but for the. And, and it's actually part of, uh, you know, of course, the ordinance, and it's an action part, part of the ordinance. And with the, with the music, um, one, we were, um, were wrangling with changing the ordinance. We did get a noise meter, and the officers trained up. Uh, but no, we have not enforced it. We've given written warnings up until this point. Yeah, I think it's important to note that up until just a couple months ago, we would have had to rely on music that disturbs a person of reasonable yes. sensibilities because we didn't have a noise meter. And so we had no way of enforcing decibel levels until that time. 
but that is the standard that had been determined to be unconstitutional. So that, um, so, so really we're looking at, I mean, I think the police department by getting a noise meter has really sort of advanced the city's ability to deal with this issue, you know, many fold. Uh, but it's that's only been here for a couple of months and we had to get people trained on it as well. And so so I think that's why the data isn't a little bit more developed, because it's really only been a short amount of time where we've had this ability to enforce the decibel levels. And prior to that, the only things we could enforce were something like trash trucks operating outside of the hours they're allowed to operate because that was not a reasonable person standard and it didn't require a noise meter. So that's that's why we're operating without a ton of data for you. Got it. Thank you. Um, so I guess all right. given all the comments we've gotten, um, so I would support extending the hours, daytime hours until 10 p.m. because I do think that, you know, like we started this meeting when we talked about how to support businesses um, that are trying to cope through COVID. I do think that extra flexibility is helpful, but at the same time, I also want to balance hearing residents' concerns with obviously those hot spots that we have in the city and making sure that we are respectful of their um, their needs too. And I certainly don't want to reward where we have um, already violations. So I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you. All right, Mr. Lickenhouse, followed by Vice Mayor Conley. Thanks, Captain Rao. Um, Explain to me again the, the reading of the decibels. Obviously, it's not 65 decibels standing next to the person that's playing the music. It's across the property line? Yes, sir. Okay. And when you say across the property line, are you literally going to the edge of the parcel of land standing outside that, that boundary and, and testing for the decibel level? So what, what, I'm having, what I'm having my people do is to, in, in the situation, uh, most situations is to is to go across the street okay? okay so not not looking to go onto the sidewalk of the um of the property of, or of the business in question yeah okay okay um so i mean that's why we're also encouraging people uh, i mean inside an apartment building i, I mean i know it, it's you know they don't always want the police to to come into their apartment building but but having us go in there and having a noise reading from inside their apartment really is kind of what i would say the penultimate of uh of readings you know so we're we're, we're not sitting there on the sidewalk we're actually in a person's house you know behind the window behind the door you know behind a glass door taking a reading to get a real true reading of what uh of what people are hearing yeah okay yeah i think um kind of my take on this is you, you know i i i would like to have businesses have the opportunity to provide outdoor entertainment uh, i guess where i'm still lost on this and this thing has in my mind become a hot mess um for a number of reasons but i'm still having a difficult time recognizing exactly what is the right decibel level obviously we have an enforcement issue but I want to make sure that the decibel levels um, are are appropriate. Um, one of the things that uh, you know I think is a, is a challenge here too is that just the way some buildings are situated. Meaning, if 65 decibels read from across a property line is actually reasonable, um, you know the fact that you've got one business with loud music playing or just music playing at the appropriate level facing the broad side of a building with with windows and not a whole lot of insulation in between, it's going to sound like that music's uh, in, in your apartment. However, it's not necessarily that the music is actually playing too loud. It's that you've just got buildings that are too close um, for, for what is allowed. And so that's a bit of a, a tricky issue there. But I go back to this, this idea that I, I still don't have a good idea of what the appropriate decibel level is based on where uh, it's being read. But I do know that it, you know, if we've got dozens and dozens of people that are complaining, um, then then we we've got an issue and we need to solve that. But I want to make sure that we're not doing it with too heavy of a hand because I don't want to stymie the ability for businesses uh, to to be able to to open up their their doors and, and play music. I do agree with extending the hours. But again, I want to make sure that we've got the right decibel level and it's being enforced accordingly. Is there and this is a question for the city attorney. What is the ob what is the obligation of a landlord 
uh, who has tenants who may be in violation of this noise ordinance? Um, I would think, I don't know that a landlord would have an obligation, but most leases would require that the tenant be compliant in their operations, be compliant with laws. And mm -hmm. so um, most landlords would be able to um, take some action. Yeah, I, I think that that's important to know um, because as the as the city densifies uh, and and we've got more buildings popping up, I think it's important for landlords to understand and whether this comes through the chamber, the chamber of commerce comes from development planning that landlords need to understand that they also have a responsibility uh, as it relates to the businesses that are putting in there to be um, upfront with them about the expectations. Uh, and their compliance mm -hmm. with the laws and not just, you know, open it up to folks that are expecting to operate their business one way when when they didn't know. Um, so I'd like for 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 that to get out there as well. Uh, and then um, finally, did did the chamber weigh in on this issue? I know the chamber members have, but has the chamber formally weighed in on this? No, Why, uh, Mr. Lickenhouse, I'll just say that the chamber board meeting, there's a chamber board meeting tomorrow morning. Yeah. So I think that the board hasn't discussed it at all yet. Okay. The, yeah, legis I'm, I'm, the legislative committee met and discussed it on Thursday. And uh, as the vice mayor said, the full board is to discuss it tomorrow. Uh, Sally Cole, the executive director, uh, offered some thoughts by text but i think i think we're waiting for the full board to discuss it before there's like an official position okay i, I guess where i'll leave it um maybe this is a bit of a, a circular discussion here is that i just want to know what the right measurement is what's reasonable and then want to make sure that it's enforced uh, and as long as it's reasonable to the point where you know it's not going to disturb too many folks unless they just happen to live in a building that is broadside face to a business and there's you know even a, even a low music unfortunately is going to penetrate those walls because of the construction type um that that it that it is being enforced uh, and we and and we've got compliance with that enforcement and again i want to make sure that landlords are educated as to what their tenants are or are not allowed to do uh, but again i still don't have a good question as to what that um, what that decibel level reading is um, and what should be considered reasonable because 65, even, you know, 10 yards away, um, it doesn't seem very, very loud to me. And I'm not sure you could have any music uh, at that point. Um, but if folks are at 90 decibels, uh, that's obviously a, a much bigger difference. So that's an enforcement issue. Uh, but again, I, I do I do support, you know, expanding the the, the hours, but it's got to be at reasonable levels and it's got to be enforced. Uh, and folks have to be in compliance because we've got to measure the interest of both businesses and residents. All right, thank you, Vice Mayor Connolly. Thanks, Mayor Charter. Um, I have not really weighed in on this one because I feel like we have a big ordinance and we're trying to solve a very precise problem. And the precise problem is that there's outdoor music because of COVID that is really affecting the people who live nearby, um, particularly those in Pearson Square and 455 Tinner Hill, in such a way that I have never seen such agonizing letters from people that they are unhappy in their homes, they are uncomfortable, their children can't sleep, they can't sleep, they can't schedule business calls. So it seems like we need more, we need to do something about that situation in particular. There are other in the Falls Church Distillery, right there on Tinner Hill Avenue, Tinner Hill Street, is right next to those buildings. There are other outdoor venues that don't have this problem because they're not quite so close to other residences. So what I'm wondering is, what can we do mitigation-wise to make both of these things work? Are, has, has Falls Church Distillery tried to point their speakers in a different direction? Do they have that capability? Are they just out there... I mean, if you have a good speaker system, you can not bother the people that are right by you because there's because there's ways to direct your speakers. Um, have we said you can only have music twice a week 
once a week. Uh, it seems like whenever they feel like it, basically, before 9 p.m., they can make as much noise as they want, and there have been no consequences. And that just, that's really frustrating to me. When we first got the um, message, I think it was from Mr. Kamenetz back in the fall, I thought, oh, surely this can be taken care of easily, but it's not been taken care of easily. So I feel like there's two things here. One is a big overall noise ordinance talking about very specific things like decibel level and measurable things and where you're taking those measurements from. Yep. But then there's also just the lives of the human beings who are living there who all have different tolerances for noise, who should not be continually having to hear music for three days in a row, for five hours a day, eight hours a day. So it seems to me that if we could also put into effect that if you expect that you're going to have three full days of music, you need to get a permit for that. That can't happen every single solitary weekend. That just doesn't make sense. Um, over, uh, let's see, where Sala's Outpost is, they can't put music out there because the condo association owns the plaza. So they have to get permission to do anything outside from the condo association. Well, this is an apartment complex and it's not the same piece of property, but it just seems like we need to make sure that the needs of the people that are living there 24 hours a day and are in their homes because of COVID um, are also being taken care of. And it seems like we've bent over backwards to accommodate Falls Church Distillery. We have, you know, how many times the police have been called there many times that we've never issued, we've issued warnings. Um, it's not that it's one angry person. It's dozens of people that are very unhappy with what's going on in this situation. So while I, I I'm just concerned that the ordinance we're doing is not going to solve the problem that we have. Um, let me just mention that in both Alexandria and Arlington, they do have a mechanism for putting specific conditions on uses with this type of entertainment and, and noise, but they do it, it's a land use process. In other words, it's a zoning permit. In Arlington, there's live entertainment permits. In Alexandria, every restaurant has to have a special use permit. And through that process, they address the specifics of individual situations. And, and trying, we can't, I don't think, really do that effectively through our noise ordinance, but I think it's something to think about down the road, which would be a fairly good-sized project in terms of a zoning, creating a zoning mechanism when there's live entertainment or music like this that would set the number of nights and um, address which way the speakers would point, et cetera. And, and I, that, I think that's great. You know, that sort of punts the issue, but that is a better way to deal with the specifics of each situation. I, I think that is a really good idea um, because all this outdoor music snuck up on us with COVID. We, it wasn't an issue before, and yes. it's become an issue because of the pandemic. And I think some people really like it. So they probably would like to keep doing it in the future once we're able to go inside. Some mm -hmm. of those outdoor venues have been really popular and successful for the businesses. So I think that we need to go down that path where we're actually looking at what direction are these speakers pointing so that they're staying within the radius of where we want them to stay and providing relief. But in the meantime, it's February 8th and the people that live next door, are, they haven't gotten relief yet. So what can we do now? Um, coming up on President's Day weekend or whatever for the people who live in that building right now. Well, I, mean, I presume this coming weeks there's probably going to be a whole lot of live entertainment given the weather that's proposed. Or uh, that's true. Okay. Yeah. The weather's on our side. <laughs> so, uh, but I, I tell you, if, if you're finished, I have a few comments. Are you done, Vice Mayor? Um, so, let yeah, me I had one more question about yeah. the small power equipment. Uh huh. Just the word, the, what's up on the screen right now? Mm -hmm. I'm try, I'm reading it and there's something wrong with that sentence. It shall be unlawful to operate or permit the operation of any powered saw drill, sander, grinder, lawn or garden tool or similar device during daytime hours so as to cause a noise disturbance across the property boundary and it is prohibited. Yeah, that, but 
it's the existing wording, I think. We could strike the last few words. The okay. and it is prohibited part. Okay. We can we can do that through the advertisement unless anybody has an objection. I think it's just sort of meaning and it is prohibited to do that, but that's already because, part of the Because it's unlawful. Okay. And then we take out all those hours. Is that because daytime hours I, was previously yes, defined? Yes, that's a simplification okay. because though that was the same as the definition of daytime hours. Okay, and then what does the last sentence mean? So the last sentence means that um, you can operate such equipment for up to three hours in any 24-hour period. And this is the one that would allow people to operate lawnmowers, leaf blowers, et cetera. Okay, so is there any chance that someone might decide to turn on their leaf blower at 2 o'clock in the morning? Because it's three hours um, in a 24-hour period? I suppose it is. We could make it uh, that it can be operated for no more than three hours during the daytime in any 24-hour period. Yeah, I think that's better. Yes. We can do that, yes. Thanks. All right, we should start okay, winding. Now I'm done. We should now start I'm done. Okay, great. We should start winding this conversation down. I suspect we, can, we could go uh, speaking right. at 24 hours uh, pretty good ways on this. Ms. Hardy? Uh, while we were on small power equipment, um, I think we did receive a public comment about commercial usage of kind of lawn equipment versus residential use. And so mm -hmm. while I'm fine with us carving out an exception for uh, personal use, I think I can imagine a scenario where you have, you know, commercial, you know, four or five leaf blowers coming out that would really do create a lot of noise. And I think we want to create the flexibility for the police to be able to come out um, and enforce that if necessary, especially if it was going on for many hours. So can that be modified so that the carve out is really just for personal use? Um, we, we could do it sort of in residential districts maybe, but the, I was concerned about that because it, it seems to me that residential and commercial property owners all need to maintain their lawns. We do have the three hour limit would apply um, to both commercial and residential use. But I mean, and you could define it as that way, but it just seemed to me that we, it shouldn't be impossible for a person in a commercial district to, to maintain their lawn either. And it's not necessarily a commercial district. I think it's the commercial equipment that's used would be louder than say your residential okay. lawn mower. <laughs> and then we're, we would need to define that equipment so that we would know what the distinction was. Um, I'm gonna suggest that we leave this as it is with Mary Beth's change. And I think trying to find a way to limit commercial use um, is something that we can work on between first and second reading, if that would be okay to try to address that, because I think that's going to take some consideration of how we define what's allowed and what's not as commercial. Great. Yep, but let's take that our, down as something we can do between readings. Thank you. Yes, I think that all would right. work. All right. So um, as I said, why don't we try to wrap up this conversation? Um, I do have a few comments and questions that I'll quickly go through. I mean, one, I guess I would just say that we should be a little careful I wouldn't say be not be clever by half, but I think when we start to split all these hairs, we may find we create more problems than we solve with some of the subtlety of language. I think we should remember why we're talking about this right now. And I think the main reason is because we have live outdoor entertainment that's causing disturbance to neighbors, which has created a whole lot of complaints we're not sure what to do with. And so I think that some of these other issues the police have effectively dealt with over the years and probably can continue to do so. But let me let me just give a few thoughts. I mean, one, I would say, look, why are we here today? Probably in large measure because of COVID, people are doing out things outside they used to do inside. So venues that used to have music indoors are now doing it outdoors for longer periods of time because they have to to stay in business. Will that be the case when we go back from COVID? 
Um, I think that people will still want to do things outside, but to not to the same extent now. People are not going to want to have as much outdoor entertainment in December when they can do it inside. And so I think we should keep that in mind as well, that this may somewhat, um, I wouldn't say resolve itself, but alleviate itself to some degree when COVID's over. Secondly, it sounds like there's at least one restaurant or business that's responsible for the vast majority, if I heard things correctly, of complaints in recent days or recent times. And I would suggest the EDA, the EDO, or the chamber reach out to them and try to go out and the police as well and try to offer some real solutions, such as the vice mayor's suggestion to turn your speakers the other way or turn down your base or whatever it might be to just, just take it down a notch. And I don't know what exactly that is. Maybe there's some sound dampening you can put up and point the speakers the other way and put up some inflatable wall that'll that'll cut down the echoing of noise. I have no idea. But I think sending someone out there from an organization, the police, somebody to try to work with that owner in particular would be a good idea. Um, three, um, I do have some question about just the actual language. This is kind of a lawyer, maybe talking to another lawyer, but um, city attorney, we talk about throughout this ordinance, for example, just picking um, two, for example, uh, 14.51 uh, subnumeral numeral two, it talks about you won't do this such uh, in such manner as to cause a noise disturbance. What does that mean, a, new, a noise disturbance? Isn't that subjective? What is a noise disturbance? And if we're talking about the actual um, decibel readings, then I think we should reference them so as not to cause a noise dis disturbance as defined in 15 or 14.152. But are we actually referring to the decibel chart or we're we just calling it a, a noise disturbance in some of these provisions um, yep. in 14.51? There's a definition of noise disturbance um, in the beginning of the ordinance, and we have removed the reasonable person standard from the noise disturbance, and then it does refer to the decibel chart. Okay. Um, so, and that, so we just haven't gone through, I mean, I suppose there would be a way to change that, but um, the, let's see. Let's see. Noise disturbance is a, is any sound which, um, well, here it's up on the board, on the, it's presented now at 167, endangers or injures the safety or health of humans or animals, endangers or injures personal real property or exceeds the maximum permissible mm -hmm. sound levels as they appear in the table. That's the decibel level. Got it. So that's okay. noise disturbance and as I said, we haven't gone through and tried to change that. I suppose there's probably ways to do it. Okay. So 14-52, we reference a sound, a particular sound meter, a level meter, ANSI, S1. Right. You know, should we mention an actual, is that too specific? And will we forget three years from now when there's a new ANSI code? Should we just have sort of a generic reference there as opposed to a particular ANSI level? I am going to have to go to the folks who I will look at that. We all have to go to the folks who are dealing with the noise meters. I don't know if the chief knows or Captain Rao knows at this point. Well, I mean, I imagine that's the current, the current, you know, ANSI American, whatever standard. Right. But um, I'm just concerned that if we put that in the ordinance, you know, five years from now, we'll have three different right. standards, so they move to a different number or, or nomenclature, and oh. our ordinance will have to be keep being amended every time the ANSI standard changes. Mm -hmm. And so I might just suggest that there's a generic way to do that. I might recommend that. Okay. As to the um, section on additional remedies, it seems like we were talking about this earlier that um, a violation, you know, one violation gives you the right to to get your ticket, to get an offense. And then the next thing is the remedy goes to injunction or whatever. There's nothing in between, like we talked about, like repeat offenders, you know, a second charge, we can double the fine. I sort of think like there's there's got to be something or should be something between, you know, thing one and the nuclear option about, hey, we're just shutting you down. Mm -hmm. And given that that's a big thing for both of us, we don't want to go to court and they don't want us to, to shut them down. I would suggest maybe some middle ground here or something where a repeat offenders, a second offense, you can double the fine or something like that, something short of kind of a nuclear option? Well, we've we've kind of used as the, um, and we can certainly, I, I can consider whether there's some way to build that in, but 
we what we have done is we have made the violation a class one misdemeanor. <laughs> we and so that's a fine of up to twenty five hundred and up to a year in jail. And I don't think that anybody would any judge would impose that on a first offense. So what we would be doing, I would expect, is we would come in for a first offense, go to court, get a fine, and it won't be $2,500, but we would be seeking increasing fines if we had a repeat violation. And then we also have this ability to get it declared a public nuisance to get an injunction to order it to go away. So I'll look at whether there's a way to put in the ordinance the increasing fines, but I think that, you know, in the normal course, that's how the judge would do it. And if we came in and said, Your Honor, this is the third time we've had to be in with this person and we'd ask for a bigger fine, we could get that. And at some point we move to an injunction. So uh, that's how I normally have seen it work. And I'll consider whether there's, I just, don't know that there's specific authority to lay out increasing fines in the ordinance. And we might have a case in which we don't always want to have to ask for exactly the same thing. So it might be better to just leave it as we can request up to the class one misdemeanor. Got it. And then just lastly, this notion of getting use permits, I guess I would just say from Arlington where I I practice, uh, I mean, you can have everybody get a use permit, uh, a live music uh, you know, entertainment use permit of some kind, you got to keep in mind, it's fairly cumbersome to have basically everybody in town get one of those. And yes. who's going to administer that, whether the city council is going to basically issue those for everybody in town. And then you know, if you get a whole bunch of complaints from someone, maybe you pull it or you threaten to pull right. it. But it is, it's a pretty good amount of, of work or potentially for somebody and so I would just sort of throw that out there as something that to uh, consider before we go down that path. Um, Mr. Duncan and Mr. Snyder have comments. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just a quick question. So at line 239, construction of buildings and projects, I'm thinking of when Founders Row was going up and we were pile driving uh, there for quite some time. Uh, would This wouldn't constrain us from doing that, would, would it? Or does it need some sort of special use language? Or? Um, we, uh, there's a procedure for a variance that is pretty simple. It just goes to the city manager. And um, and that's how construction variances are typically granted. And, and I will say just one other note that when restaurants had live music in the past, they typically would get a variance. And so that was a pretty simple way for us to sort of just have a conversation with them before they did it. Um, and uh, uh, so I, I'll just note that as well. Okay, good. So there's a process, the variance process that, that a future building could go through to get around any problems that are uh, brought up in line 239 to 245. Is that right? Yes, yes, it begins at line 380, but I think it's it's a good way to address the specifics of each situation okay. through the variance process because they have to contact the manager and get permission. Okay, good. My only other question, where did we land on the curfew hour? Uh, there was some talk of 10 instead of 1030. And, uh, well, I, I would say unless you believe you might want to go to 11, let's leave it at 1030. You can always adopt something that's between what we have now that is nine o'clock and 1030. And so that that gives you a little more flexibility. And if somebody wants us to move it to 11, I would suggest you do that at first mm-hmm. reading so that it gets advertised and then you have the flexibility you could need in the future. Okay, well, I think I was the one who suggested, maybe others did too, 1030, which... You know, I'm <laughs> beginning to think maybe that's a little too late if you have a situation like the one that's been mentioned here where there's just repeated violations. Mm-hmm. But by and large, you know, I think 1030 is not an unreasonable place to at least start the conversation. So we could move that back to 10 if we wanted to after first reading. Is that? What yes. You're yes. You could adopt anything between what you have today, which is nine o'clock and 1030, which is what you've advertised. What you couldn't do then if you advertise, it's 1030. What you can't do is adopt 11. Okay, thanks. 
All right, Mr. Snyder. Sure, uh, thanks a lot. Um, so I'll be brief. I, I think um, we've committed a lot of council and staff member time to this. Um, it, 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 it arises out of a specific circumstance and my request to the, the business is please do what you need to do to stay in business, but please turn the volume down. It's obvious that you're creating unnecessary issues and we'll work with you to do anything we can to keep your business open. Um, secondly, I think the letter that we got from the owner of Clarendon suggests that we're gonna have a lot of businesses who will be doing this in the future. And so I guess whether we like it or not, it's, it's time to revisit this ordinance to make sure we have something that's fair and forcible is pro-business, but also protects um, surrounding residential areas. So um, it seems like something we have to, we have to move on. Um, but I hope everyone on all sides of this issue understands that we're working really hard to get this right and fair for everyone. Thank you. All right, Vice Mayor Connolly, then Jim Snyder. I, I'd just like to say that I'd be happy to leave it at 10 o'clock. Uh, rather than change it to 10.30. I don't know if anyone else feels that way or what Ms. McCosker just explained is that we could move it later. But I'd be happy to say no later than 10 o'clock ever. Um, and I am wondering what what, is, what, are, what would the next steps be for the community that feels that they have no recourse at this point? Or that, you know, next week or the week after, whenever it warms up, this is going to happen again before we get to second reading. So this is Captain Rao. I guess from an enforcement standpoint is we can just start issuing tickets. That sounds like a plan to me. Until we come up with another enforcement mechanism. They've had plenty of warnings. Yeah, well, they, I, I, I will say there's, you know, the mayor's suggestion is a really good one. Um, I would say we have made a lot of efforts in that respect. I mean, we've had so many conversations with this one business in particular um, that it seems like so that those normal conversations of, you know, just please turn the music down and or point the speakers differently. Uh, that conversation's been had many times. Right. So, Jim Snyder. Um, um, I just wanted to mention the uh, use permit process, which can be effective, but it definitely requires staffing and it will fill up an agenda for a legislative body or a planning commission or whoever ends up using it. Seems to me the big issue here in terms of the problem you've got is where it's directly adjacent to or facing residential within a certain number of feet. And uh, otherwise, it's not really a big problem. So, Carol, I, I don't know whether you could put a different standard in terms of time cutoff, but it would seem to me that, you know, a couple of hours around the dinner time, beyond that ought to be a cutoff time for anything that close to residential projects so people can have peace of mind and quiet, you know, after the dinner hour, uh, rather than an all night party kind of thing. And so perhaps you could have a different standard for ones that are close to residential if they want to do more, and they could appeal it or have a variance and get special permission with all the things it would take to keep it quiet. But I think it's a locational and it's a frequency, it's a location, and it's a, it's a length of time in the evening that's causing the problem. And uh, it needs a different set of standards for that kind of a situation. All right, so this is a complicated problem that I, we obviously have wrestled with for some time. So either one or two things I think will happen tonight. Either we go ahead and, and move this forward, not at the finish line this evening, but just move it forward or we spend some more time talking about it and getting input from other folks. I guess my inclination would be to keep this thing um, heading forward and continue the conversation in the meantime. But um, uh, otherwise, I guess I would just say, let's let's hear finally what people wanna do either through a motion or through last comments. So we need to wind this uh, item down this evening. Mr. Mayor, I do have additional comments. Yeah. 
Would you like to take that now? Yes, yes I would. Uh, yes, um, that uh, from Julie Huggins, who also lives at 455 at Tinner Hill, who um, was a patron at Falls Church Distillers before pandemic. Um, she does say that sometimes the music is played at a reasonable level even now, but there has been um, there have been many times since summer 2020 that it's quite deafening for her. Um, she says she doesn't think that um, live music packs 10 p.m. is acceptable at that level. And um, she suggests more restrictions for outdoor live music at non-music venues like a bar that face residential areas, especially in places where the types of performances were not allowed in the pre-pandemic times. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Any other comments or is that the only one? That was the last one. All right. Do we have a motion that anybody would like to make now? All right. This is uh, Dave Snyder to get things moving. I move a, uh, on first reading uh, the uh, proposed ordinance. All right. Do we have a second? Second. All right, Ms. Hiscott on a second. Any further discussion? Mayor, if we could just request that we step up enforcement until this thing is done, just so that the residents have some sort of react, you know, response from us. All right. Thank yeah, you. I, request this so made. Ms. Ms. Snyder, I certainly agree with that. I, I wonder if the city should reach out to the apartment complex. It seems like the news of this ordinance was shared via the apartment complex. Um, so I wonder if we should reach out to the management there and and get either hold a meeting or get further information from residents. That's a great Got idea. It. All right. I think in addition to that, I think the actual rep or the restaurant or business would be good to reach out to as well to make sure they're aware of the changes that may be coming. Um, all right. So we've got a motion and a second. Any further discussion, Madam Clerk? And would you be scheduling the public hearing for March 8th? Do we have to schedule it, Madam uh, uh, City Attorney? Can we do it sooner than that if we so choose? Um, Carol, are you on the yes. line? Yes, I'm sorry, I was having trouble getting unmuted. I believe it could be scheduled for, is it February 22nd, Celeste? Yeah, so you could- I would have to send the ad tomorrow. Okay. So you could set it for February 22nd. I just gave it a little more time to work on any issues that came up. So if, right. if you wish to set it for February 22nd, you could do that. All right, is it, what's the consensus of council? Earlier, later? This is Snyder. I prefer the March 8th. I want to make sure that everybody reads it. Everybody has a chance to comment on it. If we have to adjust times or other things like that, we can. We have the, the, the time to do that. That would be my suggestion. We go other with March folks? 8th. All right, other folks? I would agree with Mr. Snyder. All yeah, right. I agree with that. I'd like to get some more information on decibel levels personally. All right. All right, so let's keep that, uh, keep, keep that March date. Um, which is consistent. So do we uh, need, did you want the uh, motion to be amended or changed, Madam Clerk, to include the date? Is that what you're- No, that's fine. For? I just needed that for informational purposes. Okay. Thank you. All right, any further comments? Uh, Madam Clerk, go ahead then. Ms. Conley? Yes. Mr. Duncan? Yes. Ms. Hardy? Yes. Mr. Lickenhouse? Yeah. Ms. Shantz Hiscott? Yes. Mr. Snyder? Yes. And Mayor Tarter? Yes. Motion carries seven to zero, thank you. Sure, and I guess I would just make sure Mr. Villa, Villa is um, is available when he's at Boston College to continue to work on this next year, so. Uh... <laughs> that's the plan. <laughs> yeah, that's it. I'll be here. All right, sounds good. We're counting on it. All right, you let's want keep to learn on. about the legislative process, Jack. Here you go. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> lightning, out of orbit. The lightning speed at which it happens. All right, let's move on to the next item, Madam Clerk. 
Yes, we have TO 21-02 ordinance to amend ordinances 2009, 2012, 2016, and 2018 regarding the budget of expenditures and revenues, appropriating funds for fiscal year 2021 for the general fund, stormwater fund, and the capital improvements program funds. So uh, council, uh, I'll just mention uh, briefly that this is before the council now as, a, as the third budget amendment for FY21. It's before you for first reading. Um, the, uh, we reviewed this at work session. Um, since work session, um, we have gotten word from the school administration that with respect to the use of CARES funding, to assist with the return to learning in person, that, uh, that they did actually ask for the remainder of the CARES funding. There's $250,000 that would be unappropriated at, if um, absent any other action. Um, they have asked that, um, that, 200, that, that that remaining piece be allocated to the schools for that purpose. Uh, so we wanted to just highlight that point. That would be the only change since the council saw this at work session. And if the council desired to um, to allocate the remainder of the CARES money for that purpose, that could be done by motion from the dais tonight, and then the documents would be updated for second reading to reflect that change. Um, I just wanted to note that, and um, Ms. Bawa, any other kind of key points that you would want to communicate before we answer any questions on this item? Um, uh, good evening, Mayor Tartar, members of the council. The only other change I would like to highlight, we have also added uh, 10,000 uh, for utility and food relief as part of the CARES grant uh, request um, of 160,000. So 150,000 of that is for emergency emergency rent um, assistance and uh, 10,000 for uh, food and utility. And other than that, there are no changes. Off note, a couple of projects that I can mention is uh, a request um, to move some funds from underspending in um, the Sheriff's Department uh, to pay for installation of a fire hydrant at Tinner Hill. And then we also have um, funding from uh, Rushmark, the developer of 301 West Broad to install ADA compliant ramps on sidewalks adjacent to a big chimney park. That's for 41,000 and also um, 48,000 for neighborhood traffic calming program um, by the same developer. Uh, additionally, we are requesting a transfer, one-time transfer of 177,000 from operating maintenance costs um, to fund West Columbia Trammel Branch project. And uh, this project um, has uh, milestones all set up and um, the funding can, see, can be spent right away. And this is one of the six projects that was recommended by the task force. Um, and um, I think with that, I will stop and see if there are any questions. All right, we have a few questions. One, just before we even get started on uh, people asking the questions, could you say uh, what the implications are for that allocation to the schools? What are the allocations for other things that we might have intended to use the money for or are using it currently? Um, so the 250,000 um, that um, so far is not required for anything, but any unspent funds would be used. Of course, uh, we would not leave it on the table, but we would be used uh, for um, drawing down against uh, staff costs like public safety and public health staff costs that are eligible for uh, reimbursement under CARES. Uh, additionally, um, there is uh, funding for uh, emergency rent relief and the landlords and tenants would have to go through, uh, would now have to go through Virginia Department of Housing and Community Development. Um, it is a pretty decent program from what it looks like. They're allowed to um, uh, get fair market value rent. Um, and the program is um, up till um, June of 2022. And in areas can be, um, Past rent can be drawn as far back as April 2020 uh, and uh, would allow for 15 months of uh, total rent. And paperwork has to be provided with proof of lease and all that stuff every three months. So there, there it is going to be a different process. 
And um, there is no cap right now, but if there are any changes, uh, we would not have any funding. Um, that could be one possible if a part is required um, for any rent relief um, eventually down the line if once this program is implemented. And this will start on April 1st. So we do not know all the details, but so far um, these are the details that we have received from the Virginia Department staff, uh, Department of Housing staff. And of and course, the, the, the emergency money, emergency uh, public works, et cetera. Mr. Shields, how's that going to affect you? We heard yep. that it might not be available for, for a city to use. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so that um, is, is uh, money that would be in addition to the budget that we already have. So um, it, it won't have a negative impact on services. It would have had a fiscal benefit to the city just in general. And we would have uh, sort of built it into our general fund budget uh and in, in appropriate for for future uses is that is that correct Ms. Bawa? Uh, yes future uses what do you mean like traffic calming or something like that well it probably could be used for anything in, in effect what we were going to be using it for is is just to uh, fund the city for admin leave and things like that that were already budgeted but it is a legitimate COVID-related expense, and so it really would have been, in, in effect, new new money for the city in the current fiscal year. All right, thank you. Let's open it up to questions. We've got Ms. Hardy, then we've got Mr. Schneider. Great, thank you. Um, so on the school's request for the remaining 250, um, do we have more details on what it would be for? Is it kind of for the current hybrid opening that we talked about? I think we all very much support wanting schools to reopen, but is there a timing issue where we need to get this done before they do the hybrid reopening in a couple weeks? Well, um, there was an earlier discussion of this, and this is extremely complex and demanding for the whole school administration, for parents, and for everyone. They have identified needs. They just haven't completely fleshed out exactly what the dollar amounts are going to be associated with them. So to be frank, I think the school administration has asked for a little bit of time to provide a bit more detail on how they would use the funds. But in their kind of quick analysis, uh, $250,000 is what they did put in as a request. And Kieran, um, do you have the accounting on what the schools have received already from CARES, either through us or from the state directly? Um, yes, so um, they have received 838000 approximately today, and they have um, expended all those funds. There is another 144000 that is um, the new tranche that has been announced that they received notification of that is coming. Um, um, and um, that is the one that the their board was writing a letter about the allocation procedures, but um, that should be available soon, but I do not know the exact timing of it. Got it, so the 250 would be in addition to the 838 and the 144 you just quoted. That's correct. Got it. And then I have the similar questions as what the mayor asked is, you know, what we would have used this money for if it weren't going to the schools. And I heard you say um, potential staff costs and then maybe rent relief. I think in previous conversations, we talked about how kind of the rent utility food assistance might run out by February or March. So if we do make this allocation and we have nothing left in CARES and we don't have a new federal relief bill that comes, if we have future rent relief um, requests coming, how would we fund that? So um, we have enough funds allocated for um, food and utility relief through the end of June with the 10,000 that we're requesting now. And as far as the rent relief, um, with the CDBG, we have funds till mid-March. Um, and um, starting April 1st, there is the new Virginia Department of Housing and Community Development program that uh, the tenants and landlords would have to get reimbursement directly from them uh, for assistance, emergency rent assistance. And that program is um, valid in June of 2022. So and is it guaranteed uh, that people would get the rent relief as opposed to they go directly to the state instead of coming through us? Or is it just kind of an application and then they may or may not fulfill it? 
So they will go directly to the state and get it, and uh, they can get up to 100% of the fair market value of the rent. Um, and and uh, there is no cap, uh, as there has been in the, uh, uh, as it wasn't thought of in earlier, but it has been confirmed there are there is no cap in there. Um, so um, that's the program they have put up. It hasn't started, so we do not know if there are any hiccups. Or there may be any hiccups, but okay. Thank you. That's it. Sure. All right, and, Mr. And Snyder, Snyder, followed by Mr. Lichtenhouse. Sure. So um, I asked well, two questions when this came before us before. Number one, um, is there any amount from this money that Fairfax Health Department could use in order to speed up and to provide more vaccinations for our citizens? The answer, I think, correct me, Wyatt, if I'm wrong here but the answer is no they can't really take that and really don't have a reason for it. my second inquiry was regarding the schools and and it's so critical that we open the schools we've heard from our citizens uh, it's critical for the safety of school employees um, and to get the economy uh, not only here but but elsewhere but especially here because that's our major concern up and running so we won't have to do as much rent relief. We won't have to do as much business relief and getting the school started up is fundamental, I think, to the welfare of our citizens. So I, I would support up to the $250,000 uh, addition to the uh, uh, budget amendment for those reasons. Thank you. Mr. Lichtenhouse. Yeah, does this additional $250,000 have to be allocated right now? So that, that's a uh, question that we had that uh, Kieran and I were discussing before this meeting. Um, if it were not, we would probably, this money would still then be an unallocated portion of CARES and the council could allocate it at a future date. Um, and, you know, essentially, I think the schools would probably expend the funds and then ask to be reimbursed uh, through a future allocation. The difficulty is that that's in May. That's when we typically do our last fiscal year um, wrap up. So I do think probably from the school administration's perspective, they would prefer to have the certainty that they have this allocation. But we could allocate this money before May, even though it's outside of the normal cadence. Yeah, you could always you can do a budget amendment anytime you want to. That is correct. OK, yeah, I, I, I would prefer that we wait. Um, one, because this request came after the schools had indicated they were going to open hybrid in February. So I'm still a little unclear as to what this money's used for. And if there's $970,000 or close to a million dollars um, in, in money that's already been provided, uh, I, I would just like to know what that's going to be used for as opposed to saying, yes, we'll take it and then figure it out. Uh, I, I agree with Councilman Snyder. Um, I'll, I'll move mountains uh, to get those schools open, to get kids back uh, full time. But absent a, uh, an actual plan uh, to do that and, act and, and absent uh, specific requests uh, or an explanation as to what that money is going to be used for, uh, I'd rather keep it in reserve because um, the one thing that we have not done uh, for our citizens since this closing is um, help shore up uh, some of the expenditures and the pain that most of our citizens have felt. And I'm not talking about rent relief uh, and, and, and food relief, uh, but for the general citizen. So I'd, I'd like to wait uh, and see if there is a plan what this money will actually be used for. Uh, and if we find a need uh, and can weigh that need and we've actually got a good case for expending that money between now and May, I'm happy to release that. But uh, I'd like to uh, I'd like to receive some additional details on exactly how this money is going to be used um, to, quote unquote, open up the schools, because, again, um, the commitment to open hybrids already been made, but I've not seen a commitment to opening full time. And if they need money to do that, then I'm happy to allocate it. But I haven't seen those plans or those details yet. So I'm not uh, I'm, I'm not one to to stroke a blank check and then let folks figure out how they want to spend that money. Other comments? Is there any public comment, Madam Clerk? 
No, there isn't. All right, Vice Mayor Connolly. Uh, Mr. Shields, you mentioned something earlier. I just want to clarify the process of how we got this $250,000 request from the schools. At our last meeting, Mr. Snyder said, let's make sure we cover what the schools need. And then you asked the school administration, how are you doing? Do you need more money from CARES, right? Is that what happened? You're muted. Sorry about that. That's okay. Uh, yeah, so uh, we, we did uh, relay that request. Um, one thing that I think we didn't make clear is that they needed to get back with us uh, quickly. And so I think they were thinking they had a little bit more time to put a budget together. And when we contacted them again, uh, you know, on Friday, uh, they, you know, they, they started really trying to put pencils to it. But it, it just was, you know, they've been really busy on a whole host of issues, and they just didn't have time to kind of work up a more detailed budget. They did, they did say that they, they know that they will have extra costs that they had not budgeted for in, um, in making the, the move back to in-person right. learning. So, so if we just hold this $250,000, not, not appropriated for anything specific at this point, and then give the school staff more time to provide a budget of exactly what they would use it for, then we would take up, we would do another budget amendment, not this budget amendment. So that money would just stay in our reserves. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. These CARES monies, you know, the way the state did it is they wrote the city a check. So it is in the city's coffers. Right. And so it would just stay there. We, uh, Ms. Bob, we have it until December 31st of the current year to expend it all. Is that correct? That's correct. So, and and uh, in the interim, we may get additional CARES funding that comes in. Is that correct, too? It probably won't be called CARES funding. I okay. think the next round will have a different name, but yes. Yeah, so so there there is more funding in the pipeline that we don't know how much, we don't know when, we don't know what it'll be allocated for, but we can assume that there's more coming from federal government and state government. Yes, that's the uh, read that we have, but how yeah. it plays out, obviously there's going to be twists and turns on that road. Right, right. And I know that our needs are huge in many areas. So if, if, if we can look at this budget today and look at our budget amendment and then set aside that $250,000 and wait until we get from the schools what they're going to spend it on, I think that makes sense. I just don't want to put anything in jeopardy either way, not having enough to help citizens who need rent relief or not having enough to help the schools reopen. All right. Thank you. Other comments? Mr. Snyder. Sure, Mr. Mayor, I'd like to put a motion on the table to approve the proposed budgetary amendment with up to $250,000 allocated to the schools based upon a plan and budget. All right, we've got a motion. Do we have a second? I'll second All that. Right. Excuse me? This is Debbie Hescott. I'll second that. All right. Conversation, discussion? Yeah, I'm going to say I'm not going to support that because I want to see a plan. And we've expended a lot of money. And if we've still got money in reserve, uh, I'd like to set that aside. I'm happy to move everything forward. But absent somebody telling me exactly what they're going to spend that $250,000 on, uh, I'd like to leave that off the table. So I'm not going to support it. Uh, as as proposed, but I will be more than happy uh, to allocate that money to somebody that comes with us with comes to us with a specific plan on what it's going to be used for uh, and what it's going to accomplish. So I think it'd be foolhardy of us to start handing out money uh, to folks because if you ask somebody if they need money, of course they're going to take it. And I'm not saying folks don't need it, but I want to see a plan because we've got limited funds and there's a lot of people that haven't received any assistance. And as a matter of fact, have been carrying huge burdens uh, and all that needs to be taken into consideration in due time. But absent a plan and support for that money, I think it should sit there. And then once we get that plan and the specifics, then we can deliberate uh, and make a decision. So I'm not supporting it uh, as proposed right now. 
All right, other comments? Ms. Hiscott? My understanding of that motion is that it includes a plan. That's why I seconded it. So maybe I misunderstood no, what Ross just said. No, it does include a plan. Uh, uh, to wait, my wait, can, somebody, can somebody explain to me what that means? Sure. So what we're saying is the schools have made a request. They're going to need the money. The cap is at $250,000 or maybe less. And it will only be allocated when a plan and budget is submitted for it. But it's it's already been allocated to the schools. So if we up identify to, up it, to $250,000. But if we identify another need before then, as yep. long as the schools propose if, a plan, that cannot, money is being allocated. You're right. It goes to the schools. Yeah, I'm not supporting that. Okay, fair enough. Let's have a vote. All right, other folks, other comments? So just to clarify on this issue, Mr. Shields, you have not received a detailed itemization of what they intend or would like to do with it. Uh, they've just said in general, we could use it, but not necessarily how it would be allocated. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Other comments? Anyone else, Mr. Duncan? Mr. Duncan, you may be muted. Sorry, I haven't said anything meaningful. I'm just dithering. Um, yeah, I mean, I seems a little unusual to set aside any amount of money without somewhat more specific needs being expressed. I mean, for any category, that would be a little unusual. Um, I mean, I, I, I certainly want to give schools all the resources they need. It's, you know, just a little unclear right now, I think, in their own mind. They just haven't had time. They've been busy doing, you know, putting out many other fires to specify mm -hmm. that. I don't know. To me, it would build public confidence if the schools were able to come with a very specific, you know, budget uh, as part of their overall budget, maybe. Um, so I, I think uh, as it's currently worded, I'm not sure that I'm, I'm aware I could vote for that. All right, Ms. Hiscott, and then Vice Mayor Connolly. Yeah, I know, I know I was the second on that vote, but I, I guess I was thinking that they were one and the same, but the clarification being that, in theory, you could be obligating yourself to $250,000 that you could need to spend elsewhere. So um, I, I just thank you for the clarifications. I did not understand that correctly. All right, Vice Mayor Connolly. I'm just wondering if we want to um, contact some of the schools right now and see if they want to hop on and explain or or not. I don't know. I guess to my mind, I think it's too late to to try to sort of do this on the fly. I mean, we could t we could certainly defer. And I presume we can defer this a matter to a later time. Is that right, Mr. Shields? Is there anything else in here that's so pressing it couldn't wait for, uh, you know, a couple weeks? So that's another conversation that Karen and I had. The one that is the uh, time sensitive is the seventy hundred seventy seven thousand uh, dollars for the pipe underneath the WNOD. That's an arrangement we have with the Northern Virginia Regional Park Authority. They want to know that that that's a go because they're telling their contractor to put that uh, pipe in underneath the trail. Uh, I think that's kind of the the main one. Uh, Karen, are there any others that are time sensitive? And also the um, ADA ramps on the big chimney sidewalks. Yeah, I would just say, look, if we if people are uncertain about going forward with it, then I would suggest um, you know vote as you as you think appropriate. But trying to get someone on right at eleven o'clock and sort of sort this through, I think it's going to be very difficult to try to uh, work this out at this point presuming that if a budget was available, it would have been shared with us earlier. Um, and so I would just suggest let's vote on the information we have right now. And uh, we can revisit this at any time, correct, Mr. Shields? Did you not say that earlier? So that in two weeks, if uh, a budget is proposed that people are agreeable to, we can certainly vote at that time? That's correct. Okay. Uh, it, can, it can be revisited and, and we will not... Uh, obviously do anything with that 250000 until such time as council does take action on it, if, if right. that's the decision of council. 
All right, so we have a motion right now. Let's try to wrap this up. I know Mr. Lichtenhouse has a hand up and I'm gonna recognize him, but I would say after that, why don't we just go ahead? There is a, a motion on the table and vote on that and then uh, see what else we need to do here. Mr. Lichtenhouse. No, and that's fine. No, yeah, that's fine. I was just going to suggest that uh, I feel like it would be easier to remove that portion and just vote on it at a later point in time as opposed to getting the wheels going. But if the motion's out there and it's been seconded, we obviously have to vote on that. Unless, uh, I don't I don't know, uh, I could ask the city attorney, uh, it sounds like the second for that motion understood it to be something other than it was. Um, and maybe we can ask the city attorney if it's possible for the second, the person who made the second uh, to withdraw their support. I think that, um... I think that you'd be better off to have a motion to amend, <clears throat> take that off and vote on the motion to amend since yeah. the second has already been made and there's been discussion. Uh, so I, I would make a motion to amend uh, that we pull that money out until we get a detailed plan and then we can vote on it immediately as to uh, as to the uh, as to whether that that plan is is worth, you know, allocating $250,000. So my, my motion is to move this forward absent, but take that $250,000 allocation out of the, um, uh, out of this, uh, this particular, uh, we can talk about it at a later point in time. All right. So we have a motion to amend. Do we have a second on the motion to amend? I'll second it. All right, so Ms. Hardy on the second. So I'm gonna ask the city attorney to make sure we do this properly. What will we vote on now? The amendment itself? Yes, you vote on the motion to amend. And then after you've decided whether you're, then you would take up either the amended motion or the original motion, depending on the results of this vote and do your vote on that. All right, so let's go ahead and vote on the amendment then. So unless there's further comment, Madam Clerk. I will note that the first motion was to approve the ordinance. It wasn't to grant first reading. This is, is on first reading. So I don't know if that makes a difference. Well, I, I think I understood the intention to be the motion that was before council on that, on this resolution okay. or on this ordinance. <laughs> So I, I think agree. I think it was a motion on first reading to approve right. the first reading. All right, let's go ahead and vote on the amendment then. This would yeah. be on the amendment to take out the two hundred fifty thousand um, dollars from that motion. So this is on the amendment only, Madam Clerk. Ms. Conley. Uh, yes. Mr. Duncan. Yes. Ms. Hardy. Yes. Mr. Litkenhouse. Yes. Ms. Shantz Hiscott? Yes. Mr. Snyder? No. Mayor Tarter? Yes. Motion carries six to one. Thank you. All right, and Madam so, City Attorney, then we will vote on the amended motion? Yes. All right. And, and so the amended motion, I believe, is the motion that is um, set forth in the um, staff report. OK. So this is to right. grant first reading to TO 21-02, schedule second reading and public hearing for February 22nd, 2021, and advertise the same according to law. Is that what we're voting on? Yes, that's what I understood the original motion to be with with the 250000 Which has now been moved point. by amendment, so we're back. As, to as, as amended, right. So you're back to that original motion. Okay, so let's go ahead, uh, Madam Clerk. Ms. Conley? I think yes. I'm still confused, but um. So it, just to clarify and correct me if I'm wrong, but essentially what's on the table right now is the motion that was a pro proposed or suggested in the staff report, which does not include the $250,000 at this time. Correct. Okay. So that $250,000 is still in reserves will be allocated in the future once we see a detailed budget for its use. Yes. So if that is the case, yeah. then my answer is yes. All right. Keep going, Madam Clerk. Mr. Duncan? 
Yes. Ms. Hardy? Yes. Mr. Lickenhouse? Yes. Ms. Shantz Hiscott? Yes. Mr. Snyder? Yes. Mayor Tarter? Yes. Motion carries seven to zero. Thank you. All right, thank you. Let's move on. Other business, and remember, we do have a closed session tonight. Um, is there other business not in the agenda, standing committee, regional committee reports, any just general council member co uh, comments? All right, let's go ahead and take a five minute break to get the uh, cameras down and we'll come in, reconvene in closed session. All right, so we'll reconvene at 10 after 11 in closed session. Can I confirm before the TV goes down if we need to take the motion? Oh, I'm sorry. We do. We should take the motion. Thank let you, me just, Yeah, let me just make sure it got provided to me, which I don't. Oh, here it is. I'm sorry. It's yes, over it here. Yep. Yeah, let's go ahead and do the motion before he goes glow in a clo or before the TV comes down. So upon a motion made by Council Member Connolly. Connolly. And seconded by Council Member Hardy. I'm going to go with Hardy. That's good. Um, and passed by Voter City Council. Council went in a closed session pursuant to Virginia Code Section 2.2-3711A34. Discussion or consideration of the acquisition of real property for a public purpose or the disposition of publicly held real property where discussion and open meeting would adversely affect the bargaining position or negotiating strategy of the public body. Discussion of private property as affordable housing. Councilor Connolly? Yes. Duncan? Yes. Hardy? Yes. yes. Lichtenhouse? Yep. Hiscott? Yes. Snyder? Yes. Tarter? Yep. All right, the time is 11.06. We'll reconvene in closed session with the cameras down at 11.11. .11. Yep, you should be fine. All right, we're, All right, ready, to, uh, we're ready to go. All right, we're reconvening an open session. Before we do that, we're going to go ahead and make a motion or two. Uh, upon a motion made by Council Member Connolly. And seconded by Council Member yes, Scott. And passed by a vote of Council or City Council. Council reconvene an open session. Council Member Connolly? Yes. Duncan? Yes. Hardy? Yes. Lichtenhouse? Yeah. Is Scott? Yes. Snyder? Yeah. Carter? Yep. All right, it's 11.45. This is a certification. Upon a motion made by Council Member... Connolly. And seconded by Council Member... Scott. And passed upon affirmative roll call vote in open session, it was certified that only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements and... Only such public business matters as were identified in the motion by which the closed meeting was convened were heard, discussed, or considered in the closed session of meeting by the body. Councilor Connolly? Yes. Duncan? Yes. Hardy? Is that a yes, Hardy? Yes. All right. Lichtenhouse? Yeah. Hiscott? Yes. Snyder? Yeah. Carter? Yep. All right. Uh, anything else anybody wants to say before we adjourn? All right, let's call it a night. We're adjourned. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Thank Good night. you. Good night. Thanks. Good night. Bye. We finished before.